Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. On May 6, 1937, one of the most photographed and familiar disasters of the 20th century occurred as the German Zeppelin airship LZ-129 Hindenburg burst into a massive ball of flames as it descended over Lakehurst, New Jersey. Seven million cubic feet of ignited hydrogen incinerated the dirigible in just 34 seconds, long before it could hit the ground. The disaster shocked the world, dealt a blow to Nazi propaganda, effectively ended the era of lighter-than-air travel and claimed the lives of 35 crew members and passengers and one person on the ground. To this day, the anguished cries of radio reporter Herbert Morrison as he broadcast from the scene can still send chills down the spine of the most jaded listener. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get this started. Get this started. It's flying and it's flashing. It's flashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's just it's, it's like 20, oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flame is crashing to the ground. Not quite to the morning mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just speeding around it. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people as friends are out there. It's a, it's, it's a, oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laying down massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can't hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. Charlie, that's terrible. I, I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because they, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Morrison's famous radio report is not all that lingers of this fiery calamity. Some believe the spirits of the Hindenburg dead still linger as well. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In the Oakland Cemetery, a bronze monument to tragedy is said to bring death to anyone who touches it. While camping, a man has dreams of a dark-haired woman several nights in a row. Normally, it wouldn't be anything to be all that concerned about but it is something to fear if you are near the French Broad River. Alien visitors, beings from a different dimension, our planet even had tree monsters and sentient pyramids showing up, and all in the year 1965. A retired naval officer reports rocks falling through his home's roof, dozens in a single day, with no explanation of where they came from. In 1994, a man has a paranormal experience with a popular song recorded two decades earlier. Is there a clandestine space program designed to save the elite from a global catastrophe? October 24, 1953, Evelyn Hartley, a 15-year-old sophomore from La Crosse, Wisconsin, vanished without a trace while on her way to a babysitting job. It was like something out of a Halloween urban legend but in this case, the horror was real. The odd happening that takes place here and there in a house more than likely can be explained in some rational way. Even quite a few strange occurrences could probably be explained by science. But when the events seem to never stop, perhaps it's time to think something else is going on. 
Legend tells a centuries-old curse was placed upon Dudley Town in Connecticut. The town turned into a horrible place where people committed suicide or went insane. October 24, 1926 – Something went wrong during a performance by Harry Houdini. A week later, he would be dead. The Hamilton Byrne family was anything but typical. Rather, it was a doomsday cult with a leader who believed herself to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. These and many more stories in this episode of Weird Darkness. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Dirigibles, or airships, first came to the attention of the public as a method of air travel in the late 1700s. They were really considered more of a novelty than for practical use until the latter part of the 1800s, when a few inventors began to attach propulsion motors to their balloons in order to get from one place to another. However, the golden age of airships really began in July 1900 with the launch of the Luftschiff Zeppelin LZ-1. This grand experiment led to the most successful airships of all time – the Zeppelins. They were named after Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, who began working with rigid airship designs in the 1890s. The airships had a framework composed of triangular lattice girders, covered with fabric and containing separate gas cells. Tail fins were added for control and stability and two engine and crew cars hung beneath the hull-driving propellers, which were attached to the sides of the frame by means of long drive shafts. Additionally, there was a passenger compartment located halfway between the two cars. During World War I, airships were briefly used as bombers, but they proved to be a terrifying yet inaccurate weapon. Navigation and target selection proved to be difficult under the best of conditions. The darkness, high altitudes, and clouds that were frequently encountered by Zeppelin missions reduced accuracy even further. Their flammable hydrogen-lifting gas made them vulnerable at lower altitudes. Several were shot down in flames, and others crashed en route. They began to fly higher, above the range of other aircraft, but this made their accuracy even worse. In the end, airships were best suited for scouting during the war and the bombing raids turned out to be disastrous in terms of morale, men, and material. Many pioneers of the German airship service died in what was the first strategic bombing campaign in history. After the war, a number of nations operated airships, including Britain, the United States, Italy, France, Russia, and Japan. Most discontinued their use by the early 1930s and within a few years only Germany was operating a passenger service between Frankfurt and Recife in Brazil, which took 68 hours. In the middle 1930s, the company started building an airship that was specifically designed to offer passenger service across the Atlantic to the United States. After Adolf Hitler's rise to power, around this same time, the Zeppelin lent itself to exploitation by the Nazis. The German public perceived the development of the airships as a national achievement, rather than as a business one. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels employed airships in mass events as a daunting symbol of Nazi power. With no other country in the world employing the massive airships on a regular basis, Germany flaunted its superiority in this area, starting a regular transatlantic service in March 1936. On May 3, 1937, the Luftschiff Zeppelin 129 Hindenburg departed from the Rhine-Main Airport in Frankfurt, Germany, 
lifting into the air toward the United States. The airship's namesake was the recently deceased Paul von Hindenburg, a World War I field marshal, president of the Weimar Republic, and a national figure. The Hindenburg was over 800 feet long, 135 feet in diameter, and weighed approximately 250 tons. To provide the lift that was required to get the monstrous ship off the ground, its 16 gas cells had to be filled with combustible hydrogen. Since its maiden flight in 1936, the Hindenburg had completed 20 flights across the Atlantic Ocean and had broken the speed record of previous Zeppelins. Under normal conditions, its engines accelerated the airship to 84 miles per hour, but favorable winds had allowed for top speeds of up to 188 miles per hour. A westward trip from Germany to the United States took an average of 36 hours and 42 minutes. Although the Hindenburg had been built to accommodate between 50 and 70 passengers, it carried only 36 travelers in addition to 61 crew members when it embarked on its fatal final flight. The passengers could rest in 20 heated cabins at the center of the hull's lower decks. Amenities on board included a dining room, a reading, writing, and smoking room, and centrally located restrooms with showers. Panoramic windows embedded in the concave hull provided spectacular views for those on the promenade deck. From the start of the trip, Captains Max Pruss and Ernest Lehman had to confront a number of problems, all of them due to bad weather conditions. Storms first kept the airship from crossing the English Channel and then delayed its journey across the Atlantic. Blown off course to Newfoundland, it passed over Manhattan behind schedule at 3 p.m. on May 6. It finally reached the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey at 6 p.m., but heavy rain kept the airship from initiating landing procedures. After an hour, the storm passed and the Hindenburg approached the mooring mast. It was to be a high landing, known as a flying moor, after which the airship would be winched down to ground level. This type of landing maneuver reduced the number of necessary ground crew, but required more time. The landing was initiated at 7 p.m. At 7.09 p.m., however, the airship made a sharp, full-speed left turn to the west around the landing field because the ground crew was not ready. Two minutes later, it turned back toward the landing field and began to slow. Three minutes later, Captain Pruss ordered all engines full astern so that the airship could be stopped. At 7.17 p.m., the wind shifted direction to the southwest, and Pruss was forced to make a second sweeping sharp turn, this time to the starboard. Two minutes later, the airship made another sharp turn and dropped its water ballast because the Hindenburg was stern heavy. Six men were also sent to the bow to trim the airship, which allowed it to be on an even keel as it stopped. At 7.21 p.m., the mooring lines were dropped from the bow. The starboard line was dropped first, followed by the port line. The port line was connected to the post of the ground winch. The starboard line was left dangling. At 7.25 p.m., a few witnesses saw the fabric ahead of the upper fin flutter as though gas was leaking. Other witnesses also reported seeing blue discharges, possibly static electricity, moments before fire erupted on top of the ship. Several other eyewitness testimonies suggest that the first flame appeared on the port side just ahead of the port fin and was followed by flames that burned on top. On board, people heard a muffled explosion and those in the front of the ship felt a shock as the port mooring rope jerked on its winch. The officers in the control car initially thought the shock was created by a broken rope. Moments later, the Hindenburg caught fire and became engulfed in flames. The fire quickly spread, almost instantly. A water tank and a fuel tank burst out of the hull due to the shock of the blast. This shock also caused a crack behind the passenger decks and the rear of the structure imploded. The stern of the ship lost its buoyancy and the bow lurched upwards. As the Hindenburg's tail crashed into the ground, a burst of flame came out of the nose killing nine of the twelve crew members in the bow. As the airship continued to fall with its bow pointing upwards, part of the port side directly behind the passenger deck collapsed inward, 
and the gas cell there exploded. The airship's gondola wheel touched the ground, causing the burning ship to bounce upwards. At this point, most of the fabric had burned away. Finally, the airship went crashing onto the ground, bow first. The Hindenburg had been completely destroyed. Various theories have been suggested as to the cause of the fire on board the airship. Contemporaries suspected sabotage or a lightning strike, while most recent experts believe that maneuvering in the storm may have caused a buildup of static electricity in the ship's envelope. An electric discharge could have ignited the hydrogen. To this day, no one knows for sure. Unbelievably, despite the violent fire, most of the crew and passengers survived. Of the 36 passengers and 61 crew members, 13 of the passengers and 22 members of the crew perished. As the burning airship had crashed down on the landing field, the American landing crew had fled in a panic, but one linesman, Alan Hagman, had been killed by falling debris. The majority of the airship crew who died were up inside the ship's hull, where they either had no easy escape route or were too close to the bow of the ship, which hung burning in the air for them to find a way out. Most of the passengers who were killed were trapped in the starboard side of the passenger deck. Not only had the wind blown the fire toward the starboard side, but the ship had also rolled slightly to that side when it hit the ground, sealing off the observation windows and cutting off the escape of any passengers on that side of the ship. To make matters worse, the sliding door leading from the starboard passengers area to the central foyer and gangway stairs through which rescuers led many passengers to safety, jammed shut in the crash, which also trapped the starboard side passengers. A few of them did escape, but most did not. By contrast, all but a few of the passengers on the port side of the dirigible survived the fire, most escaping virtually unscathed. When the control car crashed to the ground, most of the officers jumped out of the windows and became separated. First Officer Albert Samt found Captain Max Pruss going back into the wreckage to look for survivors. Pruss was badly burned on his face and he required months of hospitalization and surgery, but he survived. Captain Ernst Lehmann escaped the crash with burns to his head and arms and severe burns across most of his back. Although his injuries did not seem as severe as those of Captain Pruss, he died at a nearby hospital the next day. Out of the 12 crewmen in the bow of the ship, only three of them survived. Four of these men were standing on the mooring shelf, a platform at the very tip of the bow from which the front landing ropes and mooring cables were released to the ground crew and which was directly in front of gas cell number 16. The rest were standing either along the lower keel walkway ahead of the control car or were on platforms beside the stairway that led up the curve of the bow to the mooring shelf. During the fire, as the bow hung in the air at a steep angle, flames shot forward and burst through the bow, roasting the unfortunate men alive. The three men from the forward section that survived, elevator operator Kurt Bauer, cook Alfred Grosinger, and electrician Joseph Liebrecht were those furthest aft of the bow, and Bauer and Grosinger happened to be standing near two large triangular air vents through which cool air was being drawn by the fire. They managed to escape with only superficial burns. The other men either fell into the fire or tried to leap from the Hindenburg when it was still too high in the air. Three of the four men standing on the mooring shelf inside the very tip of the bow were actually taken from the wreck alive, though one of them, a rigger named Eric Spell, died shortly afterward in the air station's infirmary. The other two, Helmsman Alfred Bernard and apprentice elevator operator Ludwig Falber initially survived the fire but died at area hospitals later that night. The four crew members who had been in the tail fin survived the disaster. Although they were closest to the origin of the fire, they were sheltered by the structure of the lower fin. They escaped by climbing out of the fin's access hatch when the tail hit the ground. The Hindenburg disaster remains one of the most widely known calamities in American history, thanks largely to the wide press coverage that the airship fire attracted. There was a large amount of newsreel coverage and photographs taken of the crash, 
as well as Herbert Morrison's recorded on-the-scene eyewitness radio report for station WLS in Chicago, which was broadcast the next day. This was the first transatlantic flight by a Zeppelin to the United States that year, and it was heavily publicized, bringing many journalists to the scene. The photographs and film footage of the scene were tragic, but Morrison's radio broadcast remains one of the most famous in history. The film footage at the scene, as well as Morrison's passionate recording, shattered public faith in airships and marked the end of the giant passenger-carrying airships. The Hindenburg crash certainly marked the end of an era, closing the story with a scene of horror that still resonates today as an eerie haunting at the Naval Air Station Hospital. The hospital, known officially at that time as Naval Dispensary Lakehurst, was in the middle of the disaster on the night the Hindenburg fell burning from the sky. The doctors, nurses, and corpsmen that were stationed there in 1937 offered their assistance during the tragic event, although little detail is known about how the medical personnel on the site triaged the wounded or cared for the dead. It is known that the dispensary was utilized after the crash, though, and that many of the injured were brought there. The role the hospital played has been commemorated by the state of New Jersey and has been listed on the Registry of Historical Sites, and many New Jersey ghost buffs have listed the hospital as one of the state's haunted sites as well. The Naval Air Station in Lakehurst played an important role in transatlantic airship flights, the base commanding officer at the time was Lt. Commander C. E. Rosendahl, who eventually rose to the grade of Vice Admiral and was a longtime proponent of airship aviation. The base hospital, which is now known as the Branch Medical Clinic of the National Naval Medical Center, became a key player in the events that followed the Hindenburg crash. Lt. Carl Victor Green, Jr., the Naval Air Station base physician, along with his son Robert, was among those watching the airship as it approached the mooring tower. The Hindenburg was running late, and Robert had anxiously looked forward to seeing it arrive at the base. It was evening, but quite light, Lt. Green recalled in an interview many years later. The nose of the silver ship was pointed toward the town of Lakehurst. She was poised for her pulling down and landing tower docking. Suddenly, there were three rapid explosions, Green remembered. The rear half of the vessel was totally enveloped in bright orange flame. A blast of heat blew over us, standing a half mile away. He and his son watched in shock and terror as the mighty Zeppelin fell to the ground in a blazing ball of fire. I hurried to the base hospital. I watched people walking in, carried into the hospital or ambulance garage, which had become a temporary morgue, Green said. Fortunately, only one man from the ground crew died at the hospital. The hull of the ship fell on him after he tripped and fell on the railroad tracks used to stabilize the airship after mooring. Many of the injured were treated at the hospital, and several of them died. On the morning after the disaster, smoke was still rising from the black and twisted skeleton that had once been the world's largest flying vessel. Eyewitnesses on the scene claimed they would never forget the horrible smell of burning flesh that was in the air. A number of bodies were unidentified, and they were moved into the crew's quarters in the hangar. It had been hastily transformed into a temporary morgue. The small group of men and women filed past the charred remains of 26 of the victims in an attempt to identify them. Detachments of sailors were posted as guards around the ruins of the airship, and no information was given out to the curiosity seekers who flocked to the area. Men who served on the base at that time stated that they would never forget those dark days in 1937. The Branch Medical Clinic of today, once a full-service naval hospital, was built in 1921 when the base first opened as an airship station. Officers and corpsmen stationed at the clinic will say without reservation that it is a great duty station for enjoying the Jersey Shore and nearby cities like Philadelphia, Atlantic City, and New York, but they will often add that strange things happen at the old hospital that cannot easily be explained. It is not uncommon, they have said, 
to hear mysterious footsteps, rattling doors, loud crashes, voices, and to see lights flashing off and on. Many who have been stationed here have come to believe that some of those who have died in the building do not rest in peace. The majority of them believe that the spirits of those who died in the Hindenburg disaster have remained behind to haunt the clinic and the surrounding buildings. Is the naval station haunted? Many who have worked here believe that it is. But whether you believe in ghosts or not, the crash of the Hindenburg remains a tangible part of the history of the Lakehurst Naval Station that will never be forgotten. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll learn about Blotnik, a marsh monster that can appear to be human in order to lure you into its deadly trap. But first, who or what are the black-eyed children? That's up next. He is young and intelligent and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge, physically untrained and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival, he seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk is to become a singer or teller of stories. But in Eric Banfeld's case, he must be a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. They have been encountered worldwide. Their eyes are solid black with no white showing. Who are they and why are they so different from the rest of us? There are many stories of encounters with strange beings who appear to be inhuman because of their unusual eye color and odd behavior. People who have met these individuals had a weird sense of dread. Are there rational explanations for these remarkable encounters? Or do perhaps aliens walk among us? Can you judge a person by looking in his eyes? Some say that your eyes are the window to your soul. Have you ever met anyone whose eyes are nothing but complete darkness? Those who encountered black-eyed people say not only are their eyes dark, but their whole being is as well. It is as if their souls are enveloped in darkness. In the world of the paranormal, we often hear of people who had encounters with the most remarkable beings. Perhaps the most bizarre and uncanny stories involve the mysterious black-eyed people. There are, of course, many people who have dark eyes. We often meet people who have dark brown eyes and we certainly do not find these persons to be strange. However, Black is not a natural eye coloration. The white part of a human eye is called the sclera and it comprises five-sixths of the outer surface of the eye. Every healthy person, regardless of race, has a white sclera. Animals, on the other hand, can have a very dark sclera. Dogs, horses, and lizards, for example, often have a black sclera. Health problems can sometimes cause the sclera to become yellow in people. Certain medication like eye drops can result in the sclera becoming transparent. When the appropriate administration of medication has been completed, the sclera then returns to white again. People who have met black-eyed beings claim these individuals had solid black eyes, no sclera at all. In other words, 
These beings sclera, pupils, and iris were completely black. What is most interesting is that people are not only affected by the black color of the eyes, but also these beings' peculiar attitude and behavior. They are different. Based on eyewitnesses' descriptions, we learn that the black-eyed beings share some common characteristics. People who had encounters with black-eyed beings were overwhelmed with a sense of intense fear. It was as if these beings should be avoided at all costs. Another common characteristic often reported by witnesses is a sense of evil. In some cases, people reported that the black-eyed individuals had olive-colored skin. It seems difficult to determine a pattern in their clothes. Sometimes they're dressed in black, on other occasions they wear various colors. In some reported incidents, the black-eyed people were dressed in clothes that appeared old-fashioned. Let us examine what some who met the black-eyed people had to say. One of the eyewitnesses, Chris and her husband, were traveling on I-75 in Michigan when they decided to make a stop at a rest area. Coming out of the women's room, Chris came face to face with a thin, dark-haired woman with black eyes staring directly at her. My husband and I were on our way up north on I-75 during the afternoon. Luckily, it was not at our normal time in the evening. We have a little place in northern Lower Michigan and often go up there for the weekends. As was our custom, we pulled in at our usual rest stop and I went into the women's restroom. As I was preparing to leave the room, I suddenly noticed a thin, dark-haired woman standing alone and staring directly at me. I instantly felt a terrible sense of dread, as though there was something deeply unnatural about her. I then noticed the eyes, which had been staring coldly at me, and they were completely black. I saw no color whatsoever and no pupils. I felt an extremely strong need to get away from her as quickly as possible, as there was something quietly threatening about her. Her stare was devoid of any emotion other than something very cold and disconnected. My instant and unwavering feeling during this whole experience was that she was not human. I don't know what made me feel this so strongly, but it was my most singular, strongest sense while looking at her. There also was something almost predatory about her, as though she was honing in on prey while she stood there so still. I also had a strange sense of her feeling superior or stronger in some way. Again, the sense of a predator watching its prey. I left as quickly as possible, showing as little reaction to her as possible. It seemed important for some unknown reason for me to act unaffected by her while in her presence. I felt a huge sense of relief as I got back into the car and left. I have to say that this was one of the most memorable, brief experiences I've ever had around a person, especially a stranger. I've never been able to shake the inexplicable feeling that she wasn't human," said Chris. Another curious account comes from T, a 47-year-old apartment manager in Portland, Oregon. T, who worked there for 20 years, is used to meeting people of all races and ages and yet, when he encountered a young, black-eyed man, he simply could not come to terms with the stranger's eyes. According to T, the man was not a normal person. He was a young boy of about 17 or 18, approximately, T said. He asked me about an open apartment for rent. I remember feeling very scared and shaken by his appearance. He did not look weird by his dress or such. It was his eyes. I remember feeling the hair on my neck stand up and I was shaking just from looking in his eyes. Like Chris, T also felt that deep sense of malevolence. He continues, I could not look him straight in the eyes. I felt like I was about to die. Now, some people may think that I was just overreacting or something, but the eyes were completely black, like there was no real pupil. He spoke normally to me, but I had to just shut the door in his face and get as far from him as I could. 
I felt like I was in extreme danger, T explained. A very interesting case comes from Australia. This story is about a strange man seen in an elevator in a bank building, as told by the bank executive who worked late that evening. I found to my surprise that a few people have had similar experiences regarding people with pitch black eyes. Unlike some, though, I didn't feel a sense of dread or a feeling that I was about to die. I felt more an awareness and discomfort, like when you see someone advance angrily towards you only to walk past you. Anyways, it was September 2nd, 2000, and one of the roles as an executive is you sometimes have to put in really late nights. My office was on the fifth floor and it was coming up to 12 in the morning. I was the only employee, as far as I know, on the first five floors apart from Ben, another fellow banker on my floor, and Stan, who is a security officer. The elevator stops at floor two and in comes a tall man with more or less a black crew cut. The first thing I did was open my mouth to ask what sector he was from and who gave him permission, but as I looked into his eyes, they were entirely black. The pupils, the retinas, everything. I remember not really being spooked about his eyes. To be honest, I just thought he might have had a disability in his eyes. As the elevator slowly starts up moving back on route, he asks me where I was going and I simply replied, home. He then asked why, and I more or less laughed and just said that I wanted to go to sleep and see my wife. He then just murmured very softly like he was talking to himself, it must be nice to have a home. I figured he was just being friendly and that he must be renting. As we got to B1, I realized he hadn't pushed the button on where he was going, so I asked, where are you going? to which he replied rather angrily, looking at me with his creepy eyes, nowhere. At this point, the eyewitness stated he ran to his car. When he looked behind him, he noticed the strange man in the elevator did not get out. He continues on with his account. Now, the real freaky part, as I drove down the street, all the lights were out. And this is in Sydney, city of NSW. Then I turn and guess who's walking just ahead of the car? our favorite black-eyed man. No need to say I sped home, probably breaking five road laws. How could he have left the building and be ahead of me when he had no car and went up to floor six? It gets weirder. On the videotapes and records, there shows no one using the elevator at that time apart from me. In many cases, people who encountered black-eyed children feel an almost indescribable sense of fear. These children appear to be different from other normal kids. This incident took place in Abilene, Texas. A journalist was sitting in his parked car late at night writing a check to pay an internet bill. Suddenly, two children approached him for help, knocking on his car window. They were asking for a ride home to retrieve money from their mother to see a popular movie at the movie theater close to the parked vehicle only one of the boys spoke to the journalist. But why were the children asking for a ride home when the final showing of the film was already half over? According to the eyewitness statement, Come on, mister, let us in. We can't get in your car until you do, you know. Just let us in, and we'll be gone before you know it. We'll go to our mother's house. We locked eyes. To my horror, I realized my hand had strayed toward the door lock, which was engaged, and I was in the process of opening it. I pulled it away, probably a bit too violently, but it did force me to look away from the children. I turned back. Uh, um... I offered weakly, and then my mind snapped into sharp focus. For the first time, I noticed their eyes. They were coal black. No pupil, no iris, just two staring orbs reflecting the red and white light of the marquee. At that point, I know my expression betrayed me. The silent one had a look of horror on his face and a combination that seemed to indicate A, the impossible had just happened and we'd been found out. The spokesman, on the other hand, wore a mask of anger, his eyes glittering brightly in the half-light. Come on, mister, he said. We won't hurt you. You have to let us in. We don't have a gun. 
That last statement scared the living hell out of me. Because at that point, by his tone, he was plainly saying, we don't need a gun. He noticed my hand, shooting down toward the gear shift. Spokesman's final words contain an anger that was complete and whole, and yet contained in some respects a tone of panic. We can't come in unless you tell us it's okay. Let us in. I ripped the car into reverse. Thank goodness no one was coming up behind me and tore out of the parking lot, recalled the man from Texas. A woman called Adele also experienced an interesting and scary encounter involving black-eyed children who appear out of nowhere late at night. I was sitting in my bedroom reading a book when, at about 11 p.m., I heard a knocking, a slow, constant one. I got up out of bed to see what it was. I looked out of the window and, to my surprise, saw two children. I opened the window and asked them what they wanted at this time of night. They replied by saying simply, let us in. I said no and asked what for. We want to use your bathroom. I was quite shocked that children of about 10 years old wanted to use a stranger's bathroom at this time of night. I told them no, closed the window, but looked at them through the glass. I glanced at their eyes, and I have never, ever seen eyes like them. They were black, completely black. I got the feeling of evil and unhappiness. It surrounded me. It was horrible, Adele said. Undoubtedly, strange encounters with black-eyed people are a very interesting phenomenon. In our lifetime, we do meet people we consider to be different and not normal. Although, it must be added, that the definition of normal varies from person to person. What is normal to one person is abnormal to another. However, to be strange and different cannot be compared with being not human. Those who encountered the black-eyed people believe these individuals are either extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings. Is it really possible that aliens walk among us or is it only a psychological reaction to a person who has simply an unusual appearance and behavior? Perhaps it sounds far-fetched, but if aliens wanted to infiltrate our society, they could, in fact, pose as human beings. Perhaps the old saying is true after all, your eyes are the window to your soul. Perhaps the black eyes reveal who these beings really are. Who are the black-eyed people? we leave it up to you to think and judge these accounts for yourself. My little brother committed suicide on June 13, 2015. It was a very sad and very hard time for me. We were living together and I was trying to help him get on his feet, but it was obviously no help. On September 13, 2015, I woke up at midnight to go to the bathroom. I heard tapping on the door and the handle jiggled. I figured it was my wife trying to come in, so I opened the door, but no one was there. I went to the room and she was still sound asleep. I ignored it and passed out. The next day, I moved to a different town with my parents. That night I went to bed at midnight and fell asleep. I woke up to my bed shaking. Every time I fell asleep, my bed would vibrate or shake. I eventually passed out an hour before my alarm went off for work. Around midnight on September 15, 2015, I went to bed and then heard footsteps outside my room. I got up to investigate, but found nothing. Then my bathroom door slowly closed and my curtains slowly opened. I was so scared, I froze. Then someone peeked around the door. I got out my phone and took a picture. In the picture, there was a solid-looking orb at the foot of my bed. Today, I was with my best friend and I went to get a motor for my truck. We started talking about my brother and played his favorite song. The song ended, 
and we played three different songs. After that, the CD went right back to my brother's song. We listened to it, and then a country song played. Right as the song played, a soda can in the back seat crushed. I am freaked out. What's happening? Do I need help? In our ancestors' consciousness, shaped by legends and myths, marshes and other wetlands were considered to be elusive and unpredictable places of evil and dark forces. People believed that the depths of marshes, enveloped in mist and brightened only by moonlight, were places inhabited by evil spirits, waiting for hunters and travelers to lure them into a marsh, causing troubles and even death. One of such spirit is Master of Marshes, Blotnik, usually depicted as a man or as an elderly man who's covered with dirt, algae, and fish scales. In some legends, he is said to have long arms and a tail. He would appear to people as a large-bellied, naked man with frog's arms, bug-eyed, large mouth, and long beard. Sometimes he pretends to be an old man. He can also alter his appearance to be a stepping stone in a marsh or shallow water that helps to cross the dangerous area. If you step on such a stone, the Bolotnik, he slips away under your feet and you fall into the thick waters of the marshes up to your neck. You are doomed. Bolotnik likes to attract people to their death and he makes it easy because marshes are very deceptive. In one moment they appear as safe and suddenly they can become deadly traps. It is Bolotnik, master of marshes, that creates these traps for all living creatures. The marshes are most deadly in the evening and at night, and it is said that spirits of the marshes are most active in this time of day. Bolotnik does not like any loud sounds, so it is wise to be very quiet when passing through marshes. Bolotnik's companion is his wife, Bolotnitsa, who changes her appearance depending on circumstance. As a beautiful water maiden, she has the ability to attract people passing by to go into the marshes. Pretending to be lost, she uses her beauty and her trickery. By crying, she asks to be let out of the forest. She lures a person into the marsh. She is considered to be the most beautiful maiden of all Slavic mythology, and it is almost impossible to distinguish Bolonitsa from a real beautiful maiden. The only perceptible difference is that Bolotnitsa always sits with legs and feet hidden beneath her, trying to hide her frog-like feet. Among other evil spirits that rule the realm of marshes is Mamuna, a female swamp demon in Slavic mythology. This creature, believed to be malevolent and dangerous, used to take the form of an ugly old woman with a hairy body. On her head, she wore a red hat with a fern twig attached to it. Mamuna was said to kidnap human babies just after they were born and replace them with her own children. Changelings, with disproportionate body, with certain disabilities, large or very small heads, a huge abdomen, a hairy body, or long claws. Ancient Slavs believed that in order to protect a child against being kidnapped by the demonic Mamuna, a mother had to tie a red ribbon around the baby's hand. This custom is still preserved in some regions of Poland, for example, or put a red hat on the baby's head and shield its face from the light of the moon. In case Mamuna managed to kidnap a baby away, the mother who lost her child had to take the changeling to a midden whip it with a birch twig and pour over it water from an eggshell, shouting, take yours, give mine back, at which point Mamona normally felt sorry for her offspring and took it away, returning the one she stole. Up next on Weird Darkness, it's a creepy pasta that I've been asked about often because it is so good. It's the Seer of Possibilities. (laughs) 
Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Back in the early 70s, I found myself sleeping on beaches, flop houses, and the like. Stayed in some very weird places, including a cave. Fact is, I lived in that cave for a while. It was pretty nice as far as caves go. It wasn't huge, but big enough. The main area, what I thought of as my living quarters, was about the size of a studio apartment. At the back, it branched off into a couple of tunnels. It didn't smell all funky of bat shit or animal either, so I thought it was pretty safe. It gave me a place to sleep, or get out of the rain at any rate, until something better came along. During the day, I'd walk down to the wharf and play my flute for the tourists and make a little coin. I'd usually take it and get some food or other necessity. On the way back to the cave, I'd gather firewood. As it got dark, I'd build myself a nice little campfire by the mouth of the cave, but back a ways. I'd sit by it and have my dinner, maybe read a bit or watch the flames until I felt tired enough to sleep. Overall, not a bad life. One day, I woke up to a really bad downpour. Couldn't see much past the mouth it was raining so hard. Made me happy to be in this nice, dry cave instead of huddling under a plastic trash bag. I stoked up the fire and was feeling pretty good. I'd made a habit of bringing in a few more sticks of wood than I thought I'd use so I could keep the fire going for quite a while. I still had most of a jar of peanut butter and some crackers and a paperback I hadn't read yet. It seemed to me I was pretty well set for the day. I was sitting there, reading, when some movement caught the corner of my eye. I turned toward the cave's opening, not knowing what to expect. Between flickering firelight and the rain, I could barely make out the form of a man standing at the entrance. I stood up, calling out, Hello? The guy didn't say a word, just reached out his hand, palm up, then raised his other arm as if to show me he was unarmed. Pretty strange, but okay. I tell him to come in before he drowns. His steps are hesitant, almost like he's scared of me and he's stooped over. I smile and invite him to sit by the fire and ask if he's hungry. PB on crackers isn't fancy, but when you're hungry enough, it's a feast. He smiled back and shook his head no. Two things struck me at once. He was older than dirt, filthy, and he was bone dry. Bone dry. When he just came out of the pouring rain? That's not right. Rain is water, water makes things wet, and this guy is dry. I start asking questions like, what's he doing out in this weather? If he got lost or something? Again, with the head shake, no. Then I wonder if maybe he's a mute or something. I didn't ask it out loud, and he says, No, sonny, I can talk just wondering about you. But I guess you mean no harm. You ain't no claim jumper, are you? I laughed. Nope, no claim jumper here. Didn't know this was a mine either. 
Is and isn't. It was natural when I found it. You see in the tunnels, right? I dug those, mostly by hand. Great. I just invited a lunatic to share my fire, was my first thought. Followed by just an old man having me on. Followed by, how did he know about those tunnels then? Maybe he has been here before. Nope, not crazy. And yep, was here long before you were. Told you it's my claim. I stared in disbelief. I had not spoken one word of what I was thinking aloud. Just then, there was the loudest clap of thunder, and my head turned instinctively toward the mouth of the cave as lightning lit up the outside. I must have jumped a foot when that thunder sounded. Laughing at myself, I turned back to where the old man sat, but he was gone. As old as he was, he couldn't have moved fast enough for me not to see him if he'd headed towards the back, and he sure didn't pass me going out. Sometimes, otherworldly beings find interesting ways to try and contact you. They might use a Ouija board or maybe come to you in a dream, or sometimes they speak through another person. They each have their own style and preference that's particular to them. The one who contacted Jack spoke to him through his computer, or I guess you could say the communication was through on-screen text. The first time it happened, Jack had been sitting at his computer playing solitaire. A blinking red light from the router indicated that his internet connection was down again. This was at least a weekly occurrence, and Jack was getting used to his spotty internet service. As he moved his cards, the game faded into a solid black screen and the red text appeared. Hi, Jack. I need a favor from you. You're a very special person, and I know you'll help me. I can't ask this of just anyone. I really need your help. Jack paused for a second. The router light was still blinking red. Is this some sort of joke? He couldn't help but wonder. Several moments later, the message continued. Yes, Jack, I know this is weird for you, but I don't want you to worry. This is just a small, easy favor I need. I'll make sure you're rewarded. Now, nearly in a panic, Jack reached around and pulled the internet cable completely from the wall. Still here, Jack. I don't want to waste any more of your time, so I'll get right to what I need. Tomorrow, when you go to work, I need you to move the large potted plant that's next to the elevator on the ground floor. All you have to do is pull it out three inches from the wall. If you do it at 8.17 a.m., nobody else will be in the area. Jack sat there refusing to respond, still trying to figure out what was happening. The writing continued. Look, Jack, I'm asking you because I know you'll do it. You won't let me down. You're special. We'll talk tomorrow. Jack pulled the power cord from the wall, and the computer went blank. Did that really just happen, he thought? Still shaking from the experience, he took a warm shower and got ready for bed, convincing himself that He'd either had some crazy dream or that it was just some elaborate joke. But who would play that kind of joke on him? He didn't really have friends or enemies. He woke up the next morning feeling refreshed. Work would start at 8.30 a.m. and Jack was never late. He pulled into the parking lot at 8.10 a.m. Normally, he'd just go right in but the message had told him to move the plant at 8.17 a.m. Was he really going to do it? Overnight, Jack's fear had turned into curiosity. Let's say he moved the plant. He wouldn't be doing anything wrong or illegal, right? In Jack's mind, the most reasonable course of action was to move the plant. He'd do it, nothing would happen, and he'd be able to put this whole crazy matter behind him. One minute before 8.17, Jack left his car and walked towards the building. He entered the foyer at the exact time he was supposed to. The message was right. Nobody else was around. Odd, Jack thought. The building was normally busy this time of morning, but this temporary lull had been accurately predicted. 
Fine, let's see what happens, Jack muttered to himself. He walked up to the large potted plant placed firmly between the two elevators in the lobby of the ten-story building. The plant looked like it was fake, a decoration people passed every day without really noticing. It was heavier than Jack realized. He put some might into his effort and pulled the plant out three inches to his best estimate. He stood back and looked at the plant, then looked around the lobby. People were coming in behind him now, and the lobby was starting to fill up again. Nobody seemed to notice the plant was in a slightly different location. Nothing seemed different at all. Jack skipped the next elevator and waited. Waited for… something. But nothing happened. Finally, Jack entered the elevator and made it to his seventh floor cubicle on time like always. If you ever asked Jack's co-workers to describe him, you'd hear words like polite, quiet, respectful, and competent. And while those words were all accurate, they gave little indication of the truth, the truth that Jack really didn't like most people. That's not to say he disliked them, just that he had very little interest in getting to know them or being their friend. Save for one. Allie, the girl who sat two cubicles down from him, was the only person he wanted to know more about. With her big smile, blonde hair, and beautiful figure, Jack was very interested in learning all about her. Despite his lack of success with women in the past, he was actually doing a fair job getting to know her. Every morning, as he passed her cubicle, he'd stop for a chat. The chats were one minute at first, then two minutes, then several minutes. Jack was surprised that she actually seemed to like him. On this particular morning, their daily conversation lasted only a couple of minutes. As they exchanged their morning greetings and talked about Allie's wild night out, the elevator doors opened up behind them. Out hobbled James Bentley, the boss of both Jack and Allie. James' loud complaining could be heard through the office. My damn foot! What happened, James? came the mumbled queries. It's that damn plant they have in the lobby. I ran right into it and twisted my ankle. James, you can barely walk. You need to go to the hospital, came Allie's concerned reply. Can't do it now. I have meetings all day. Too important to cancel. I'll just have to tough it out. Jack, feeling stunned, left Allie's cubicle mid-conversation and sunk down into his chair. It was his fault. He was sure of it. How could he have been so stupid and careless? Still, no use in worrying about it now. A twisted ankle would heal. Everything would be all right. Upon his return home, Jack went immediately to his computer and turned it on. As soon as the computer booted up, the screen went black and a new message popped up. How was your day, Jack? He sat there, staring at the screen, not knowing how to answer. The message on the screen continued. Actually, I know how your day was but never let it be said that I am not polite. You're wondering what's going on. You want to know why James Bentley had to twist his ankle. Well, Jack, this chain of events isn't done playing out. I don't want to tell you too much, too soon, but this will all make sense to you in short order. Just go to work tomorrow like you normally do. Don't worry about a thing, Jack. You'll be rewarded. You're special. Talk to you tomorrow. Jack sat back in his chair. What was going on? Who was this that was sending him messages? Jack's curiosity was fully engaged, and he was almost a bit excited to see what would happen next. The next morning at work started off as any ordinary day. Jack noticed that the plant had been pushed back fully against the wall, probably by the night cleaning crew. James Bentley showed up shortly after lunch, hobbling into the office on his one good foot. Man, this foot is killing me! Jack could overhear him say, but apparently James still had a meeting he didn't want to miss. It wasn't until around three o'clock that Jack saw him again. James, who always seemed to prefer Allie over others, came limping up to her cubicle. Allie, you're not doing anything right now, are you? Um, no, nothing that can't wait till tomorrow, I guess. Good. Could you please drive me to see my doctor? I probably should have gone yesterday, but... I just couldn't get away. This pain is just killing me right now, and I don't think I can drive myself. 
I barely made it here this morning, and I don't think I can even push the gas pedal now. We can take my car if you want. Yeah, th that's fine, James. I don't have a problem taking you. Turning to Jack, she said her goodbye. See you tomorrow, Jackie. She put on her coat and slowly followed James as he struggled down the hallway. She gave a half turn and a shrug in Jack's direction with a little smile as she walked away. Jack felt even lonelier than normal when she was gone. It was ten minutes later that they all heard a crash. It was preceded by the loud horn of an 18-wheeler and screeching brakes. The collision itself was a sickening thud of two large metal objects colliding. Even on the seventh floor, it was loud. The office workers gasped and ran to the windows. Is that James' car? One of them asked. Hard to tell from up here, someone responded. It's so banged up. The horrifying implication of what had just happened came to Jack immediately. No, 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 he thought. This can't be true. Shaking all the way, he ran to the elevator and went to the ground floor along with several others from the office. Some of them were crying. As they joined the growing crowd around the scene of the accident, Jack could hear the far-off sound of emergency sirens. Looking past the gawkers, he could see that the 18-wheeler had hit James' car broadside. Its driver had been thrown out onto the pavement, where he lay motionless. James was sitting in the passenger seat of his car, motionless but with a surprised look on his bloody face. Jack couldn't tell if he was alive or dead. The driver's side where Allie was seated, had taken the hit. The space she'd been occupying had been compacted to a third of its original size. Allie's head was smashed open and her twisted body was broken and battered. The crowd was stunned. Tears, screams, sirens, that was all Jack could hear. Without going back inside the building, Jack ran to his car and drove home, angry and sad. He made the journey home and to his computer. There the machine sat. He wanted to turn it on but was afraid of what he'd find out. Was he really the one responsible for Allie's death? The whole chain of events had started with him. He knew he was to blame. Jack reached for the power button and then pulled his hand back. Finally, after several minutes, he found the mental strength to turn it on. The screen flickered and then went black and the familiar text started appearing on the screen. No, Jack, it's not your fault. I know you're blaming yourself, but all people die eventually, some just sooner than others. Jack stared at the screen. He resisted the urge to throw the monitor to the ground. After a moment, the writing continued. Jack, I'm going to tell you something, and I really need you to seriously consider everything I'm about to say you thought you were in love with Allie. The truth is, you just wanted to have sex with her. Every once in a great while, it's best to be blunt. Jack, she wasn't the one for you. She would have made your life miserable. Yes, you would have eventually found the courage to ask her out. She actually was interested in you. She thought you'd make a good project. Sad, really, for her, not for you. I want you to think back to all the things she told you. Why did her last boyfriend break up with her? Because she cheated on him, Jack mumbled under his breath. Because she cheated on him, Jack. The same thing she would have done to you. She would have made you happy for about two months and then miserable for the next four years. Sneaking around, laughing at you behind your back, spending all your money. Once you finally got rid of her, you would have been so jaded that you would never date again. This is true, Jack. I see all future possibilities, the ones that come to pass and the ones that don't. You've seen how she really is, Jack, but you let your lust for her blind you to the truth. Together, you and I have made sure you avoided that path. One more thing, Jack, this isn't done playing out yet. There is more to come. No! Screw you! You killed her! Jack screamed and threw the monitor from the desk. It landed on the floor and sparked out. Jack got barely any sleep that night, and the next day he wasn't sure he wanted to go to work. But the last words he'd been told had piqued his curiosity, and his anger had somewhat subsided. 
No work was done that day at the office. The company brought in grief counselors. People shared their thoughts. They cried. They hugged. James had actually survived the accident but was in a coma. The doctors thought he might recover eventually, but nobody was really sure. Late in the afternoon, Jack was approached by Diego Salbera, the head of the division. Diego was blunt and upfront, and he offered James' position to Jack. Technically, it would be a temporary promotion, but James wouldn't be back anytime soon. Diego promised him that the promotion would be made permanent once enough time had passed. Let's keep this low-key for now, Diego told him. I know it might seem quick, but the Lancaster project James was working on can't be stopped. It's too important to the company. I need someone in charge right away. This can't wait. Stunned, Jack accepted the promotion. He left work with a strange mixture of feelings, not really sure how he felt about anything. On his way home, he stopped at the electronics store and bought a new monitor. He made it home and powered up the computer. Once again, the writing came on the screen. Jack, I want to be the first one to congratulate you. I'm proud of what you've accomplished. Jack stared at the screen. Jack, I have to ask your forgiveness because I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm called the Seer. Like I told you before, I see what will be and I see what can be. It's a very powerful gift I have, but you know what, Jack? For all my power, I still can't do anything corporeal. I can predict, I can see, and with enough effort, I can even communicate. But I don't have a body. That's something that was taken from me a long, long time ago. That's why I need you, Jack. I'm an artist of sorts, an artist of human manipulation. You'll be my paintbrush and my canvas. I want you to work with me, Jack. It's all very simple. Just perform simple tasks for me from time to time. Jack was becoming more and more curious. And Jack, before you give me an answer, I want you to know a couple of things. First off, I'll never lie to you. Secondly, I'll never ask you to do anything which, taken by itself, is wrong or illegal. Yes, bad things will result, and sometimes people will die, but they're going to die eventually anyways, right Jack? And the bad will always be balanced out by something good happening to you. Jack winced at this last idea, but he fought the urge to turn the computer off. The seer was right. Everyone would die eventually. Why not let something good come of it? And what about never lying to him? If he'd known at the time that Allie was going to die, he'd have never gone through with the original favor. But as he thought more about it, he realized the seer hadn't lied to him, but had only withheld information. Still, Jack wondered if he could trust the seer. Work with me, Jack. Together we'll make incredible things happen. I'm just asking you to perform little tasks from time to time. Oh, but these little tasks will have great consequences. They're going to be beautiful, Jack, and they'll always end with a reward for you. That's the beauty of my art. One single task produces something bad and something good. Oh, one last thing, Jack. I can see you're having trouble with this. If I stopped talking to you right now, it would take you about two weeks to decide to join me. But you know what, Jack? You would join me. That's right, you're going to say yes. So instead of waiting, why don't you just say yes to me now? Let's get started, Jack. And when all this is over, you're going to thank me. I promise you. Jack considered what the seer had just said. His initial feeling of revolt was slowly fading. He paused and then for the first time he placed his fingers on the keyboard and responded directly to the seer. What do you want me to do next? As years passed, Jack did every favor the seer asked of him. And as the seer had promised, Jack was rewarded for his actions each time. The rewards often came in unexpected and interesting ways. One of the more memorable experiences for Jack happened about two years after he first agreed to help the seer. Jack, I need you to go downtown tomorrow, the seer requested. Enter Garmin's liquor at exactly 12.37 p.m. A man will ask you a question. The answer you are to give him is 27. 
As always, the seer's instructions were simple and direct, yet mysterious. The next day, as requested, Jack entered the store. In front of him, a burly construction worker was at the counter filling out a lottery playslip. Let's see here, said the construction worker. My birthday, that's the 15th. My wife's birthday, that's the 24th. And my kids, ages 2, 10, and 13. The man scratched his head and looked around, zeroing in on Jack. Hey, buddy, I need another number. You got one for me? Jack smiled. 27. Really? I was thinking about playing 35, but you know what? I like your face. Let's go with 27. With that, the man completed his slip and paid for his lottery ticket. See you, pal, he said happily, and he patted Jack on the shoulder on his way out the door. Jack tried not to put any more thought into what would happen to this man. Just let these things play out, Jack. You'll never guess how things end up, so just let yourself be surprised, the seer had advised him. Still, it was impossible not to wonder about these things from time to time. He knew, considering the way the seer worked, that there was no way possible he'd actually helped this man. But giving him a losing lottery number? Well, that was too simple for the seer. And he couldn't imagine he'd actually given him a winning number. So that's how Jack was surprised when, two weeks later, he ran into the same man again, this time at the grocery store. Hey, buddy, it's you. I remember you. Check it out. I won. Indeed, the man looked like a million dollars. Wearing new clothes, a new gold watch, and a big, goofy smile, the man walked right up to Jack. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. I'm glad you're here. I could have never won without you. Hey, let me buy these groceries for you. No, wait, that's not good enough for you. You're my good luck charm. I always got to treat people right. That's what my mom says. Reaching into his pocket, the man removed his checkbook and promptly wrote Jack a check for $10,000. It's the least I can do for my good luck charm. After thanking the man and feeling a bit confused by the whole thing, Jack raced home to his computer. After turning it on, the seer's writing appeared on the screen. Well, Jack, how does it feel to be $10,000 richer? <laughs> it feels good, but I, I can't help but wonder, we've never helped anyone before. Why are we starting now? Jack asked that question with a tinge of guilt. He never liked to admit that people were being hurt by his actions, but in this case, his curiosity overwhelmed any latent feelings of guilt. Oh, Jack, we haven't helped anyone. Yes, that man is happy now, but he'll have lost every last penny within two years. You saw it for yourself. He just gives money away. Old friends, lost relatives, they're all going to come asking him for money and there will be some very bad investments as well. The stress of losing everything is going to cause his wife to leave him. She'll take the kids, too. He'll be alone and broke, a ruined man who would have been much better off if he had never won. You needn't feel bad, Jack. It's the man's own stupidity and greed that will do this to him. Jack felt some regret, but the seer's rationalizing and focusing on his own reward always put him at peace in the end. Through the years, no two tasks were ever alike. Sometimes the effect of his actions were direct and easy to see. Other times they caused a chain reaction so complex that he simply could not follow it. Go to the country administrator's building, park in space number 43 at 4.47 p.m., came one such request. Jack did so, and two months later he met Donna, with whom he fell in love and ended up marrying. He wouldn't have even known the two events were even related if he hadn't asked the seer about it. Jack, when you parked in that space, you caused the person who would have parked there to park in a different spot. But she bumped the car next to her. She barely made a scratch, but she called her insurance agent anyway, causing him to leave the office late. He missed his train home, and while waiting for the late train, he was mugged and stabbed. He'll never fully recover. The muggers took his credit cards and used them, and Jack, I could keep going with this, but there's another 23 people involved. Sometimes these favors are going to be very complicated, but let's just say your action ultimately caused Donna to be in the exact right place for you to meet her. Jack's relationship with the seer grew. Though remaining mostly mysterious, the seer divulged enough information over time 
so that Jack could get a generalized understanding of the seer's history. From historical references, Jack knew the seer was thousands of years old. When still alive, the seer had been a powerful fortune teller and artist who foretold future happenings through paintings. A foolish king who misinterpreted the seer's prediction and lost a battle as a result had the seer executed. Unencumbered by physical senses and existing in a lonesome void, the seer's ability expanded exponentially. Finally, learning to communicate with the living, the seer began reaching out to those who would respond, including Jack. And of course, the seer knew everything about Jack. In all, it was as much of a friendship as one can have with a dead person. And Jack was grateful to the seer, too. He had a nice job, a nice house, a beautiful wife, and people respected him. He was happy, which is something he never really felt before the seer contacted him. Twelve years in total passed. Twelve good years for Jack. Task after task was completed, usually about one every month. Jack, sitting in the office of his large rural house, was contacted by the seer once again. Hi, Jack. I have a favor to ask of you. This one's the easiest yet. You don't even have to get up. Call Riago's Pizza in exactly two minutes. Let the phone ring three times. Then you hang up. Jack smiled, nice and easy. He no longer wondered about how these tasks would play out. He trusted the seer and simply did as he was told. Jack made the call, exactly two minutes later. The quietness of the household was broken 30 minutes later by the ringing doorbell. That's odd, Jack thought. Neither he nor Donna were expecting anyone. Jack looked out the peephole and saw a pizza delivery boy. The logo on his cap said, Riago's Pizza. Jack opened the door. Here's your pizza, said the boy as he thrust it into Jack's hand. But, but I didn't order this, Jack argued. Look, I don't give a damn if you ordered it or not. Mr. Riago told me to take it here, so that's what I'm doing, the delivery boy argued as he looked increasingly annoyed and spat in the bushes. Jack looked at the boy in front of him. He looked to be about 17 years old, but the most noticeable thing about him was his size. He was huge, probably about six and a half feet tall, very muscular. It's already paid for by a credit card. Just take it, because I'm not driving it back. The boy put out his hand for a tip. I don't have any cash on me, Jack told the truth. Whatever, came the disgusted reply. The boy looked past Jack into the house, then turned and walked slowly to his waiting car, looking over his shoulder as he walked. Jack closed the door and took the pizza to the living room where Donna was watching TV. After explaining what had happened, he excused himself to go to his office, promising to return shortly. Donna opened the pizza and took a piece. Come back soon, sweetie. This pizza's got all your favorite toppings on it. Donna giggled as she took a bite. Arriving in his computer, the seer's words appeared on the screen. Confused, Jack? Don't be. Your neighbor down the road ordered the pizza. Mr. Riago told the boy the correct address, but a ringing phone made it difficult for him to be heard clearly. Still, give the boy credit, he got the street right at least. So my reward is a pizza? Jack typed, a little confused. Yes, Jack, your reward is a pizza, and also the chance to spend a little time with your wife. Go down there. Share the pizza. Enjoy it. When you're done, make love to Donna. That's not one of your tasks. That's just some advice I think you should follow. Oh, by the way, your neighbors who ordered the pizza are arguing right now over the silly fact that the pizza didn't arrive. Some of the things people argue over amaze me. They really do. Their fight is going to get very heated, but you don't need to worry about that. Go enjoy your night. Jack followed the seer's advice cuddled with Donna as they enjoyed their meal, then made love to her on their big, comfortable living room couch. Donna fell asleep on the couch shortly after 11 p.m. Jack lay there awake. His latest favor, it just felt odd. Carefully extracting his arm from under Donna, Jack left the living room and headed upstairs. Sitting down at the computer, Jack typed, Are you there? Yes, Jack. I'm actually always here. I've been waiting for you to come back. That pizza delivery boy, he's quite a specimen, isn't he? Jack looked quizzically at the screen. The seer continued, he's a horrible employee. 
He was hired only three days ago, and already Mr. Riago wants to fire him. But as a physical specimen, he's strong, fast, and very observant. For example, he noticed that you didn't lock the front door after he delivered your pizza. What? Jack said aloud as he started to get up. Sit down, Jack. I need to tell you something important, and locking the door now won't change your situation. Jack slowly took his seat again at the computer, looking behind himself as he did so. You see, Jack, it's true that I never lied to you. Everything I've ever told you is 100% honest, but yes, I have withheld certain facts. You see, I told you that every task causes something bad to happen to someone else and something good to happen to you. But there's a third thing. There's an ultimate goal that each task was working toward. Remember Allie? Of course you do. What you probably don't remember about her is that she was helping to pay her brother's way through college. When she died, he had to drop out. He was going to be a great psychologist, but now he works in a factory instead. That's really too bad for our pizza delivery boy. He could have used a good therapist a few years ago, but that good therapist wasn't there for him. Instead, he got some Freudian quack. And remember our lottery winner? Yes, you do. He was a neighbor to our pizza boy, after he lost all his money, of course. He beat the boy senseless after the boy jumped into the street in front of his car. Quite a traumatic memory for our young lad. And his mother didn't care about that incident, didn't protect the boy at all. She couldn't, not after using all the drugs given to her by her boyfriend, who happened to be the one of the muggers who robbed that insurance agent. He bought the drugs with the money he made from the robbery. Do you see now the scope of my artistry? Jack sat, glaring at the monitor. He wanted to get up to check on Donna, but he was too scared to move. The seer continued, Jack, You've done over a hundred tasks for me, and each one has served an ultimate purpose, to psychologically destroy this boy, turn him into a monster, and to bring him here tonight. Don't you see, Jack, this involved tens of thousands of people and billions of possibilities. If you had failed to complete even one of the tasks, the whole chain would have collapsed. This was orchestrated by me and set in motion by you. Together, we've done something wonderful. This is a masterpiece of human manipulation, our masterpiece, and it all begins and ends with you, two perfect points in time. Tonight, wrong address, no tip, this poor boy finally snapped. He's downstairs right now. He's slitting Donna's throat at this exact moment. Jack could hear a short, muffled scream coming from the living room, followed by a gurgling noise. No! Jack screamed and stood up, running down the stairs. Jack, stop. The voice startled Jack. It was inside his head. For the first time, the seer was talking to him directly. It was a pleasant voice, a feminine voice. You can't do anything. She's already gone. He'll be coming for you shortly, and you can't stop him. But why? Jack cried with tears welling up in his eyes. It's not an artistic masterpiece if it doesn't begin and end with you, Jack. Her voice was soothing. I want you to appreciate the fact that I'm not talking to you directly. This requires all of my energy, and as a result, I'll have to rest for several years before I can contact anyone again. That's how special you are to me. Please don't feel bad about this, Jack. I want you to take a moment and enjoy our accomplishment as much as I do. The voice paused briefly and then continued. Do you know what, Jack? If I'd never contacted you, you would have lived for 85 years. 85 boring, meaningless, and bitter years. And when you died, nobody would have been at your funeral. I gave you 12 great, meaningful years. You were happy, and together we did something beautiful, something unique. Jack paused a minute and considered his 12 years of happiness and his tears of sorrow mixed with tears of joy. He turned and looked at the computer while behind him, the massive hulk of the demented delivery boy appeared in the doorway, a bloody knife in his left hand. On the screen, the last words from the seer appeared. Don't you have something to say to me, Jack? Jack wiped his tears and absorbed everything the seer had just told him. As the hulk started stepping closer to him, Jack mouthed his final words. Thank you. (sighs) 
Could a mock documentary about space and aliens actually have been true? Up next, we'll look at Alternative 3 when Weird Darkness returns. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Produced in a documentary style and originally intended to be broadcast on April 1st, the program Science Report – Alternative 3 was a skillful fiction written by award-winning screenwriter David Ambrose. Although relatively obscure, Alternative 3 has had an enduring impact since it was first broadcast in 1977. Many now believe the fictional events portrayed in the show subversively reflect reality. It has inspired hundreds of conspiracy theories about secret space missions, bases on the Moon and Mars, and even off-world fleets of advanced spacecraft. The fictional Alternative 3 culminates with the reporter decoding a videotape which reveals footage of a joint U.S.-USSR mission to Mars in 1962. Could there be any truth in such an amazing notion? Are the space programs of the global superpowers really far more advanced than they're admitting to the public? In 2001, British hacker Gary McKinnon claimed to have found astonishing evidence that such an out-of-this-world program really does exist. Hacking into top-secret Pentagon military computers, McKinnon says he found a crew manifest file detailing non-terrestrial officers. Perhaps this was, at last, the smoking gun that proved Alternative 3 wasn't entirely fictional. Could the secret space program portrayed in the program be real? As far as the general public is concerned, the American space program is run by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Signed into existence by Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1958, NASA was primarily a civilian organization built upon earlier military space programs. Its many high-profile projects like Gemini, the Apollo Moon missions, and the Space Shuttle were subject to much publicity and public scrutiny. Despite this, the U.S. Air Force continued to operate an almost entirely unknown, vast, and clandestine parallel space program even after the formation of NASA. The program rivaled, if not exceeded, the ambition of Apollo and the Space Shuttle. It operated under almost total secrecy. Its scale, scope, and objectives were obscure and only the occasional low-key press release hinted at its existence at all. Could the USAF's secret military space program be closer to the one proposed in Alternative 3? And was there technology and progress far more advanced than NASA's public space missions. The USAF has long since run black projects that were so secret to the public, and sometimes even Congress, were completely unaware of their existence. Various aircraft, such as the F-117A Nighthawk, were financed, developed, built, and operated under total secrecy. The Nighthawk's existence wasn't revealed publicly until 1988 some 11 years after its first flight. Could there have been similar top-secret space projects that remain entirely unknown to the public? 
a look at those plans that were acknowledged reveals a curious pattern. In the late 1950s, the USAF spent billions of dollars on Dinosaur, an advanced reusable space plane. They then quietly announced its cancellation in 1963. In the mid-60s, they canceled plans for a space station called the MOL, Manned Orbital Laboratory. Project Horizon was an ambitious plan for a manned moon base that predates NASA's first moon landing in 1969. It, too, was discreetly canceled before it could come to fruition. In 1989, the New York Times reported that the Air Force had shut down yet another planned manned space program with a staff of 32 astronauts and a space shuttle launching facility in Colorado. Until the announcement, which appeared in just one newspaper, the existence of this massive non-NASA space project was completely unknown. It doesn't seem credible that the U.S. Air Force would spend so many hundreds of billions of dollars on multiple manned space programs and then quietly mothball them all with no results. Could it be they were never canceled at all, but continued on in secret? And were there other, even more secret black projects we still know nothing about? If so, these programs would have been far more advanced than anything NASA publicly achieved and moves the prospect of the kind of secret space program envisioned in Alternative 3 closer to fact than fiction. A curious diary entry by President Ronald Reagan in 1985 suggests such a possibility may not be so far-fetched. In President Reagan's diaries, published long after his presidency, Reagan recounts a meeting at the White House with several top space scientists. On page 334, he states, It was fascinating. Space truly is the last frontier, and some of the developments there in astronomy, etc., are like science fiction, except they are real. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. Presuming Reagan wasn't simply confused or mistaken, this claim is impossible without the prospect of a secret space program. America's space shuttle has a capacity of only eight people, and only five shuttles were ever built. The U.S. does not and never has had, at least officially, the technology to put 300 people into space simultaneously. The science fiction reference seemed apt. However, in 2001, a computer hacker from the UK found evidence that cast this obscure entry in Reagan's diary in a sensational new light. In 2002, Scottish computer enthusiast Gary McKinnon was accused by the US government of the biggest military computer hack of all time. Under the guise of Solo, McKinnon hacked into dozens of Pentagon, U.S. Air Force, and NASA computers between 2001 and 2002. U.S. prosecutors sought his extradition and charged him with seven counts of computer-related crime, which could have seen McKinnon receive a 70-year prison sentence. His roll call of alleged crimes was impressive, disabling critical systems at a Navy air base not long after 9-11, bringing down an entire network of 2,000 U.S. Army computers and copying, changing, and deleting classified data. McKinnon himself maintains his actions were not malicious and he was merely searching for evidence of UFOs and suppressed free energy technology. If he can be believed, what he found was incredible. The first find was a spreadsheet detailing a list of USAF officers with their names and ranks. What was interesting about this was the file was titled Non-Terrestrial Officers. Based on what Elsie found, McKinnon does not think this is a reference to aliens but human officers serving in space. Also in the file were information about ship-to-ship -ship transfers. What made this file doubly strange was none of the ship names, or indeed officers, seemed to exist. McKinnon was aware of the case of Donna Hare, an ex-NASA employee who said the agency had a department in Building 8 
at the Johnson Space Center whose job was to airbrush UFOs out of space images. McKinnon found an unguarded computer at Building 8 and looked for evidence to corroborate Hare's story. Incredibly, he says he found it. There were a series of folders on the computer labeled RAW and Processed. Inside the RAW folder, he found an image of a large, silvery, cigar-shaped craft pictured in orbit over the Northern Hemisphere. Could this be a spacecraft developed by a secret space program of the kind proposed in Alternative 3? Critics of Gary McKinnon's case question why he didn't download or screen capture any of these images. The hacker himself also admits he was often high on marijuana and drunk when he hacked the computers. Caveats aside, McKinnon had provided some tantalizing evidence and support for a secret space program, but it was still weak. Was there anyone else to corroborate his claims? Some ex-employees of NASA, the military, and its defense contractors have come forward in recent years with evidence that supports the secret space program theory. Whilst some of these whistleblowers tell stories so bizarre and incredible they have to be discounted, others are more credible. In 1965, Sergeant Carl Wolf was a young electronics expert at USAF Tactical Air Command at Langley in Virginia. One day he was called over to an NSA facility to examine a fault in some photographic equipment. The lab was processing images of the moon's surface taken by the lunar orbiter. One thing immediately struck Wolf. There were hundreds of scientists from all over the world at the facility, speaking dozens of different languages. Wolf felt this peculiar, especially at the height of the Cold War. He got talking with a photographic technician processing the lunar orbiter images. The man appeared disturbed. We found a base on the backside of the moon, he said. Wolf was stunned. The technician then showed him contact prints that showed the base. Wolf observed large domes, towers, and what looked like radar dishes. The fictional Alternative 3 suggested the secret space program had built a moon base as a staging point for a mission to Mars. Was this it? Donna Hare tells a similar story. As a NASA contractor in the 1970s, she encountered an employee whose job it was to airbrush UFOs out of NASA photos. Intrigued, Hare sniffed around for more information. She heard chatter that the Apollo astronauts had observed artificial structures and even spacecraft on the moon. John Scheisler spent 36 years as an aerospace engineer at Boeing and worked on numerous NASA projects. He too recalled seeing Apollo images containing UFOs. However, when accessing NASA's official photo archive of the mission, he was unable to find the photos. The numerically indexed images had been removed from the collection. Perhaps the most unlikely whistleblower for a secret space program is the military of France. In 2007, Colonel Yves Blin of the French Department of Defense announced some very intriguing data gathered by their Graves space radar system. Some 20 to 30 satellites were detected that appeared not to exist. The U.S. Defense Department maintains a list of all satellites in orbit, including the classified military satellites of other countries, and none of these were listed. These mysterious satellites were, then, almost certainly launched by the U.S. themselves. Whilst not evidence for Alternative 3, it did prove the existence of a clandestine space program of some kind. Whatever the purpose of these satellites, they would require a large infrastructure back on Earth. Facilities, funding, technology, staff, rockets and launch pads, all operating in secret. Is it too much of a stretch, then, to suppose this infrastructure had achieved far more than just launching satellites? Could it have been responsible for the UFOs and structures observed on the Moon by some witnesses? Projects such as Horizon and Lunex envisioned military bases on the Moon that predated Apollo. Officially, they were shut down. But did they in fact continue to operate 
as deep black projects. The idea that the U.S. military may have secretly established a base on the moon is far-fetched, but not so outrageous as to be entirely dismissed. But in Alternative 3, a moon base was simply a staging point for a mission to Mars. In terms of scale, ambition, and complexity, this would be far in excess of a moon base. However, in 2010, evidence that such a mission has already occurred came from the most unlikely source. Laura Eisenhower, the great-granddaughter of former President Dwight D. Eisenhower, says she was approached in 2006 to take part in a mission to the Red Planet. She was told she would be joining a base on Mars, set up as a survival colony in the event of a catastrophe on Earth. This was then the exact same scenario proposed in Alternative 3. Eisenhower's incredible story was ridiculed by most people. However, she seems sincere and no doubt believes what happened was genuine. The possibility that she was the target of some kind of hoax or intelligence operation cannot therefore be dismissed. Alternative 3 is a very skillfully produced piece of television, weaving together news stories from the headlines of the time into a fiction credible enough that it's convinced many that it's fact. As its name suggests, Alternative 3 was the third of three proposed schemes to avert a forthcoming ecological catastrophe on Earth. The first two of these proposals, at least, were directly based on real projects undertaken in the United States. Alternative 1 was to use nuclear bombs to blow holes in the stratosphere from which greenhouse gases could escape. Whilst it may sound absurd, a controversial experiment in the 1950s did fire nuclear missiles into the atmosphere. Project Argus was ostensibly set up to measure the effects of radiation on Earth's upper atmosphere and involved the detonation of three nuclear warheads hundreds of miles over the South Atlantic Ocean. Alternative 2 was to build a vast network of underground tunnels and bases in which a select group of people could maintain the human race. Over a hundred such installations exist in North America alone. Bases such as Site R in Pennsylvania and Mount Weather in Virginia are so vast that they have their own rail networks, hospitals, and television studios. One of the most potent ideas in Alternative 3 was the prospect that mankind was on the verge of an ecological cataclysm. This was a worrying concept at the foremost of the public consciousness when the program was broadcast in 1977. Alarmist stories had begun to emerge about both global warming and global cooling. Dire warnings of extreme weather and environmental chaos were all over the newspapers. Much of Alternative 3 was, then, based in fact. Could the more outrageous aspects of the plot be true as well? Author Leslie Watkins came to believe so. Watkins was hired to write a novelization of Alternative 3 in 1978 that greatly expanded upon the story presented in the TV show. After its publication, he received hundreds of letters from what he regarded as credible sources confirming the basic premise behind the book. Watkins decided to use some of the evidence sent to him to begin a non-fiction sequel to Alternative 3, but backed out after he came to suspect his phone and correspondence was being monitored by the intelligence services. Watkins started to believe he had stumbled upon something deep and very dark. In 1989, he wrote, The book is fiction, based on fact, but I now feel that I inadvertently got very close to a secret truth. Critics of the idea of a secret space program point out the vast amount of money that would be required to mount such an operation. Whilst the U.S. military has long run black budgets, the amount of unaccounted money that would be required to construct bases on the Moon and Mars would be eye-wateringly vast. Such a program would completely dwarf the Apollo Moon missions, which cost, in current prices, $110 billion. Could such huge sums be generated off the books? 
Bill Sweetman, editor of Defense Technology International, estimated the U.S. military black budget to be $50 billion in 2010. To put that into context, NASA's budget in the same year was only $17 billion, so huge amounts of money are available, but much of that is already spent on conventional black military projects – planes, missiles, bombs, and so forth. Other sources of revenue would still be needed beyond the traditional black budget dollars. And even if such funding could be secured, could it really be spent without anyone noticing? A project on the scale of Alternative 3 would generate millions of financial transactions, employ tens or hundreds of thousands of people, and involve hundreds of technology and engineering companies. Could this really be done under absolute secrecy, without more people coming forward and admitting involvement? It's doubtful that what would effectively be the biggest undertaking in human history could really be kept so secret. If a large spaceship was really orbiting over the Northern Hemisphere, as McKinnon claimed, wouldn't it be noticed? There are hundreds of satellites in orbit from dozens of countries around the world, yet none appeared to have detected the presence of such a craft. Nor have any of the millions of amateur astronomers on Earth observed the craft with their telescopes. An orbiting spaceship and bases on the Moon and Mars would require hundreds of launches from Earth to construct all of which would have to occur in complete secrecy and remain unobserved by anyone. Furthermore, countries with a traditional enmity to the West, such as Russia, North Korea, China, and Iran, have all launched their own satellites and probes to both the Moon and Mars. How could the craft and the bases, then, be concealed from them? Alternative 3 proposes that governments from around the world would conspire together, but this would suggest that the evident hostility of such rival countries is actually a public charade. Could it really be that the Cold War, which brought the world to the brink of nuclear Armageddon on more than one occasion, was a sham and the USSR and US were secretly working together all along? Coming up, in the Oakland Cemetery, a bronze monument to tragedy is said to bring death to anyone who touches it. And if you find yourself dreaming of a dark-haired woman while sleeping near the French Broad River, it's best you get as far away from the water as possible. These stories and many more when Weird Darkness returns. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Nestled in a quiet neighborhood near Hickory Hill Park is Iowa City's Oakland Cemetery. The burial ground is home to numerous monuments to the dead including one striking statue with a dark reputation – the Bronze Black Angel. 
The figure dates back to the early 20th century and stands watch over the graves of Teresa Dolezal and her family. Teresa moved to Iowa City with her son Eddie in the late 1800s. There, she worked as a midwife until 1891, when Eddie contracted meningitis and died. The boy's body was buried in Oakland Cemetery, and a monument carved in the shape of a tree stump was erected to mark his grave. After Eddie's death, Teresa moved to Oregon, where she met and married Nicholas Feldevert. But Feldevert was not long with this world either. He died only a few years later in 1911. Stricken by two losses so close together, Teresa returned to Iowa City and commissioned the construction of an eight-and-a-half-foot-tall bronze angel from Chicago artist Mario Corbell to memorialize her loved ones. As soon as the statue arrived by train car, stories began to circulate. When the statue was erected in 1913, Eddie's monument was moved to stand beside it, while the ashes of Nicholas Feldevert were placed within the statue's base. When Teresa Feldevert passed on in 1924, her ashes joined those of her late husband. Curiously, no death date was added to Teresa's name at the base, fueling the statue's mystery. What's more, the angel statue had turned from bronze to black by the time of Teresa's death. Local legends sprang up to explain this phenomenon, with most centering on Teresa's past. Some claimed she was an evil and mysterious woman, and that the statue changed its color to warn others to stay away from her grave. One particularly dramatic telling told of a thunderstorm on the night of Teresa's funeral. A lightning bolt struck the angel statue, scorching it black. Other versions blamed the blackening of the statue on infidelity, claiming that Teresa swore on her husband's grave to remain faithful until her death, and that the monument would turn black if she didn't keep her vow. Some even claimed that Eddie Dolezal never died of meningitis, but was murdered by Teresa herself, the angel statue blackened as a mark of her guilt. Little proof exists to corroborate such claims, and many explain the color change as the natural process of oxidation. Still, the legend persists, with some asserting that the angel's eyes had turned black as coal overnight and the blackness then spread down its face as though the angel was weeping. With such a reputation, it's no wonder the Black Angel statue is now said to possess sinister powers. According to one tale, any girl kissed in the shadow of the angel's wings will die within six months, and anyone who touches the angel on Halloween night will die within seven years. Kissing the angel directly, meanwhile, will cause a person's heart to stop instantly. One variation states that only a virgin can survive touching or kissing the statue without being struck dead. Another claims that the angel itself gets down from its pedestal and walks the cemetery at night. In 2013, the Sci-Fi Channel series Haunted Highway visited Oakland Cemetery to do an episode on the Black Angel, which aired on December 18th of 2013. Investigators captured odd sounds and visual anomalies all throughout the cemetery. When they turned their thermal cameras onto the Black Angel statue, they found that it showed up as glowing hot, even though the night around it was chilly. Whatever the truth of the many legends, there's no doubting the Black Angel's power as a monument. Nowadays, it seems like the Appalachian Trail is as crowded as a busy city street, with noisy novice hikers clad head to toe in the latest, most expensive gear, armed with GPS devices and constantly talking on their cell phones. With the hills becoming so crowded, a man who wants to get out alone in the wilderness has farther and farther to go. Such a man might decide to head out on his own and just follow the course of a nearby wandering river. If he started out from Asheville, his course would naturally be along the French Broad, whose wide banks skirt the city. Taking a light pack and a few days' worth of food, 
he could just set out along the course of the river, pausing frequently to watch the water rolling over its rocks and just enjoying the peacefulness and quiet still to be found on its banks. But on the first night, after he pitches his tent and settles down in his sleeping bag, he may find himself tossing and turning and troubled by strange dreams. A beautiful, dark-haired, dark-eyed woman walks in and out of his restless mind all night. And through the whole night, he dreams of nothing but her. He can never see her clearly, and she always seems like she's a great distance away. He is woken before dawn by the sound of what he thinks is singing, but the sound soon vanishes as he waits in his tent for the light to come. When dawn comes, he cooks his breakfast, packs his tent, and makes his way further down the river, moving more slowly than yesterday and still feeling groggy and dazed. He doesn't get as far down the river as he thinks he will, and when the evening comes, he is glad to pitch his tent and lay down wrapped in his bag. There, he expects sleep to come easy after his exhausting day. But again, his dreams are troubled by the vision of the dark-haired woman. Again, he awakes to the sound of singing, but this time the voice comes at midnight and the young man steps out of his tent to stand by the banks of the river in the darkness. The sound persists. A subtle, beautiful singing, full of rich melancholy and precious longing. Enchanted, he lays down by the side of the river, and with the sound in his mind, his exhausted body finally gives in, and he drifts off to sleep. When he awakes on the hard rocks, it's well past dawn, and all he can remember from his dreams is that the woman was there again, and this time she seemed much closer. On the third day, he walks even more slowly than the last, and when he gets to a certain bend in the river where the water collects in a deep pool, he finds himself unwilling to move from the spot. He pitches his tent well before dusk and sits by the river to wait. As twilight descends into night, the young man doesn't go inside of his tent, but still sits by the side of the river, staring into the deep waters of the pool. As night comes into its own, the young man hears the sweet singing once again, more indescribably beautiful than any voice he has ever heard, and as the voice grows louder, it seems to be coming from the pool of dark water by his feet. And as he looks into the pool, he seems to see the form of a beautiful, dark-haired woman rising out of the waters towards him. She is naked and more perfect than he could have imagined the smooth curves of her body seeming to repeat the slow, smooth curves of the river, and he knows that she is singing to him. Unable to resist, the young man reaches into the water to touch the woman, but as her hand wraps around his, it's not warm flesh that he feels, but cold, rough, and slimy scales and claws that dig painfully into his arm before he can pull away. Before he even has a chance to scream, the cold grip pulls him into the dark water, and he disappears below the surface and to his doom, another young life lost to the Siren of the French Broad. The story of the Siren of the French Broad first appears in print in 1845 as Tzelica, a tradition of the French Broad a 64-line poem by William Gilmore Sims published in his Southern and Western magazine, but is more widely known from the 1896 retelling in Charles Montgomery Skinner's Myths and Legends of Our Own Land. One of the most puzzling mysteries of the French Broad River itself is why exactly it is French. The name first appears in official records in 1777, and may come from the fact that with the Treaty of Paris that ended the French and Indian War in 1763, all waters that flowed into the Mississippi Basin were deemed French territory. The French Broad flows west into the Tennessee River, which eventually joins the Mississippi, and so the name might have been given around that time. There was also another nearby river that had also been named the Broad River, so the French could have been added 
to help differentiate it from the nearby Broad River. Skinner reports that the Cherokee name for the river was Salika, though this may be more a product of Skinner's imagination than the Cherokee language. Cherokee naming conventions also differed from European ones, along with Eastern Native American naming conventions in general, in that the Native Americans tended not to give single names to entire rivers, but instead gave individual names to geographically important features along the river. This approach certainly makes more sense if you're traveling along a river instead of looking at it on a map. But it was the source of miscommunication between the Europeans conducting their surveys and the Indians being asked the questions. The Europeans thought they were asking the name of the whole river, while the Indians were usually giving the name of the most convenient feature. In this way, the names of many smaller features transferred themselves onto entire rivers. The not-too-distant Hiwassi River derives its name from a Cherokee word meaning stone wall, for a landmark perhaps built by the Moonite people. The U.S. Board of Geographic Names has recorded several different names for the French Broad, including Poalico, Sotika, and Takioski, all of which may be features on the river whose identity is forever lost. Still, the name as we have it is a fine one. It reminds us of what seems like an improbable time when part of North Carolina was French territory. When Weird Darkness returns, alien visitors, beings from a different dimension, our planet even had tree monsters and sentient pyramids showing up, and all in the year 1965. Plus, a retired naval officer reports rocks falling through his home's roof throughout the day, dozens in a single 24-hour period, with no explanation of where the rocks came from. And in 1994, a man had a paranormal experience with a popular song recorded two decades earlier. These stories are up next. Depression comes to all of us at times. I know personally, as I suffer from depression myself and have most of my life. But if you can't seem to get out of it, if you're in a constant state of sadness, as I was, maybe you're even fighting thoughts of suicide, you will try just about anything to get away from that pain. You might be using drugs or alcohol to try and fight it. And if that's you, please stop and do me a favor. Make one phone call that can save your life. The Hope and Helpline is there for you right now, no matter where you are. You can speak to someone who not only wants to help you, but has likely gone through depression or addiction themselves and are in recovery. They can help you find a way off that dark path you're on in a healthy way. Call 800-830-9804. That's 800-830-9804. Call for yourself or call to help someone who can't or won't call on their own. Someone is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 800-830-9804. 800-830-9804. Looking at accounts of the strange and paranormal, one can often not escape the certain odd detail that many of these sightings happen in discernible waves and that some years seem to produce far more reports of enigmatic encounters than others. Although it is uncertain why this may be, there are some years to which truly phenomenally bizarre reports seem to gravitate, and 1965 certainly stands tall amongst them, with numerous accounts of strange visitors that seem as if they cannot possibly be from anywhere on this planet, or even this reality. In this year, we have tales of tree monsters, sentient pyramids, and just about the most flat-out mind-boggling reports of high strangeness one can hope to find. Are they interdimensional travelers, aliens, or what? Keep listening and decide for yourself. One account of an entity not quite like any other comes from the town of Poole in Dorset, England in 1965. The witness, a Terence Druss, claimed that when he was seven years old, he had awoken in his bedroom one night 
to find the surreal sight of a bizarre entity of around four feet in height, which seemed to take the form of a shimmering multicolored triangle and from which dangled two thin black arms topped with what appeared to be lobster-like pincers. When Terence quite rightly screamed in terror, his brother Broderick reportedly had come running into the room to see it himself, and the two frightened children stared in awe at the floating triangular being for a few seconds, after which it simply vanished into thin air right before their eyes. Oddly, this would not even be their only encounter with this unearthly entity. The very next day, the two brothers were reportedly walking across a parking lot when they noticed the triangular thing hovering near a nearby car, only this time its appearance had changed in that it was a complete obsidian black and it now had a beak of some sort. Terence would claim that it had seemed to be watching them and that they had run away as fast as they could. What was this thing? Was it even biological at all or some sort of mechanized creation? Was it an alien or an interdimensional traveler? Did it ever exist outside these children's imaginations? No one knows. An equally perplexing and biologically implausible being was sighted in Argentina in the very same year, in October of 1965. According to the original account printed in the Argentinian newspaper La Cronica Matutina, three schoolchildren by the name of Luis Ramirez, Maria Abella Cabana, and Rosa Carbajal were walking along near their school in a secluded part of the village in Puerto Beltran in order to retrieve water from a nearby reservoir tank when they had a rather otherworldly encounter. They claimed that they saw before them a massive, round, blob-like thing that rolled along the ground and pulsated as if alive. The entity apparently then began making circles along the dusty ground, kicking up sprays of dirt as it did so, before vanishing into a billowing cloud of dust. Unfortunately, although this baffling report is very intriguing and has been retold in other books such as Charles Bowen's 1967 The Humanoids and Gordon Crichton's Humanoids in South America, there are scant details on the sighting and no new information. Whatever these kids saw will probably never be solved. Also, in 1965 and in South America is the peculiar account of two men who witnessed an outlandish entity along a secluded rural road in Peru. In summer of that year, on the evening of August 29th, witnesses Antonio Chavez Bedoya and Julio Elda Romana were reportedly driving along an isolated stretch of the road near the town of Arequipa when their attention was captured by something standing right in the middle of the road in front of them. They slammed on the brakes and there, in the headlights, was one of the most far-out creatures one can imagine. The entity reportedly was about 31 inches in height and looked like a shrub or tree of all things, which was all black and had a single golden eye where its head would presumably be. Even odder still was the detail that it was surrounded by glittering strips of silver and gold, which swirled around it like shining confetti or tinsel making it resemble a Christmas tree in a sense. As the two puzzled men stared at it, they noticed that the large, gold-colored main eye was orbited by myriad smaller glinting eyes nestled within the creature's branches. The being stood there for a moment, possibly just as surprised as the men were, before reportedly shambling off. They would later claim that they had seen a UFO shortly afterwards although whether it was connected to the creature or not remains unknown. Whatever this seemingly plant-based life form was, there were no further reports, and it remains an enigma. Peru was also the location of yet another odd encounter in 1965. When in the summer of that year something would be sighted that toes the line between alien and interdimensional being, on the evening of August 1, 1965, a 15-year-old student named Alberto San Roman Nunez was at his home in Lima taking in a load of laundry, and it may have seemed like just any other evening, but things were about to get incredibly weird very fast. 
he was out on the roof at the time, the day coming to a close at that moment at dusk when the day melts into night, when he apparently saw a UFO descend from the darkening sky behind him. As the baffled witness looked on in disbelief, the craft evidently came to a rest right there on the roof with him, after which it opened and a bizarre creature descended from its bowels. The being was described as being around three feet tall and rather like a toad, greenish in color and hair that was covered with green lights, which may have been some sort of bioluminescence. The terrified Nunez perhaps wisely ran away immediately, but he would soon find himself surrounded by an angry red light. Thinking he was under attack, the student cowered there waiting for the worst, but as soon as it started, the strange toad-like beast got back into its craft and took off into the night sky. Interestingly, as the press began to report on the case, Nunez would retract his report and lay low. Many began to dismiss the story as a hoax, but Nunez never really stood up to those allegations. We're left to wonder just what he may or may not have seen out there, Was this the ramblings of a disturbed individual or a real event that was either covered up or recanted by the witness himself, scared of the ridicule that may follow? If it was real, was it an alien or something altogether stranger still? Since not much has come of it, we will probably never know for sure. This seems to really have been a year of oddness, because from Mexico there is yet another account from a witness named Francisco Estrada Acosta, who, on February 12, 1965, had his own brush with an inscrutable entity of the truly weird kind. On this day, Acosta allegedly was out hunting along the Santiago River in the municipality of San Luis Potosi and followed the river to a place called the San Jose Dam. It was there he reported coming across a very tall being with a large oval-shaped head, huge reddish phosphorescent eyes, and a large toad-like mouth. So far, so strange. But it really got weird when the entity allegedly reached out to Acosta with a hand that was described as being more like a flipper. The thing actually made contact with the witness, who said it was like being touched by a cold and clammy reptile, and this caused him to reel away and run off in terror. When Acosta looked back to see if the creature was chasing him, he found that it had turned away and that it sported two wing-like protrusions that resembled stumpy bat wings. It's unclear just what happened to the beast after that, and it is certainly unknown what this flipper-handed, reptilian-winged being could have possibly been. Cryptid? Alien? Interdimensional interloper? Who knows? The one thing that we can probably all agree upon, though, is that it really was quite strange. Here we've looked at an assortment of some of the oddest cases of weird entities ever seen, and they all happen to have occurred in the same exact year, 1965. While it is by no means clear whether we're dealing with aliens, cryptids, or overactive imaginations and hoaxes, One possibility that is tantalizing is that these are perhaps visitors from another dimension. Considering the sheer, pure outlandishness of these entities and their often incredibly bizarre appearances that fit with no other living thing we know of, maybe they are not only not of this world but also not even of this reality. Is it possible that these beings have, for whatever reason, either intentionally or not, managed to cross over through some veil that separates us from the alternate realities or universes? Have they somehow phased or punched through some thin spot in the membrane where the two converge to bump against one another to come spilling into our own? Also, what is the significance of 1965? Why is it that all of these over-the-top tales originated in that year? Sure, there are reports in every year but this one really produced some doozies, all coming from disparate areas. Are there perhaps certain years when these dimensions come closer together, resulting in such a series of sightings, perhaps some pull or cycle as with the ocean tides? 
or is this all mass hysteria? At this point, we simply have no idea, and we're left to simply ponder and speculate on such thoroughly weird reports. Several years ago, a colleague and I were discussing signs from departed loved ones. He was saying that in the midst of grief for his father, he had literally looked to the sky and asked his father for a sign so that he'd know that he was in a better place. As if in response to his plea, a long white feather floated down and landed on his chest. This brought him immense peace and whatever the origin of the feather, he was able to deal with his grief as he believed that it was indeed a sign from his father and that he knew that things would be okay from that point onwards. I then told him about my good friend Jim, who died a few years before. Jim had left the UK in late 1993 to travel Europe and to spend some time on a kibbutz. We were 19, and I was still saving up to travel, so we said our goodbyes in London with a plan to meet up somewhere in Europe the following summer. I'd received postcards through the winter months from him, detailing his escapades as he crossed Europe and as the months rolled on, I'd finally saved enough money to fly out to join him. I received the last letter from Jim in April 1994, telling me he had left the kibbutz and was traveling with his newfound friends from the Greek island of Rhodes, where he had been working in a bar, to Crete where we would meet in a month's time. My flight was booked, and I was excited about my adventure when one night I received a call from Jim's sister telling me that he had had a terrible accident and had drowned. While on a ferry between the two islands, he had somehow fallen from the back of the ship into the sea. One of his new friends, Mark, had jumped in to save Jim, but both were lost. Jim's body washed up on the coast a few days later. Mark's body was never found. The friends that Jim had made while he was traveling all flew to the UK for the funeral, and it was truly a celebration of his life. He was a handsome and charming guy, and when you made a friend with Jim, it was for keeps. It would have been easy to stay in the UK, but I honored our pact and I flew to Greece in May, where I lived and worked for six months. Even though I began my journey alone, I made good friends and had amazing experiences that made me the person I am today. But I missed Jim every day. He was always on my mind and still is to this day. I told my colleague how that whenever I heard Steve Miller Band's The Joker, it reminded me of Jim, as whenever he was making me laugh, I'd always tell him he was such a joker. He'd always reply quick as a flash saying, and a smoker and a midnight toker. The conversation with my colleague lulled, and after a few minutes, I went to the office radio which sat on top of a filing cabinet and switched it on. When it came on, it was playing the Joker for about 10 seconds before it switched off and became silent again. I walked back over to it and checked to see if the power cable had come loose. It was snugly seated in the back of the radio, but when I followed the cord, I saw that it had not been plugged in to the wall at all. I was overwhelmed with happiness knowing it had been a sign from Jim. Still checking in. Still the Joker. An intriguing, stone-throwing poltergeist case came from Port Louis, Mauritius, and appeared in the Melbourne Argus, February 4, 1939. The author of the article was Cappy Ricks, who the Argus introduced as a naval officer who served in Australian waters during World War I and lived for 11 years in Melbourne. He is now in business in Meridius, but forwarded the story because of former associations with the Argus, the article stated. A little focused internet searching revealed the author as James Ernest Capstick Dale. He lived from 1879 to 1940 who, according to the Commonwealth of Australia Navy July List 1918, he had been an acting lieutenant in the Australian Navy. Anyway, on to Cappy's story. 
Extraordinary Incidents Are Related by an Ex-Naval Officer from His Own Experience by Cappy Ricks. At 7.30 a.m. on September 1, 1937, a stone fell on my roof of my house, a bungalow, in the Rue Touraine Port Louis Meridius. It rebounded to the paved courtyard, striking the stones only a few inches distant from the feet of the children's nonin, a Creole girl aged 13 years. During the day, a hundred more fell, 43 in the house itself, doing, though only slight damage. It was thought at first that this was the work of mischievous boys, but the police proved such not to be the case. Stones fell later in the bedroom, when all doors and windows were closed, one falling vertically between the feet of my wife's four sisters coming to a rest as it fell. Others fell in the court, and the nonin rushed into the house in terror with three stones following her in, horizontally. The bombardment ceased as night fell, and the nonin left for her home but it was resumed at 7.30 the following morning. None of the stones was such as are common to the locality. One of them, a flat one some seven inches long, had a hole at its pointed end, and into this I inserted my pencil to swing the stone around and around as I perplexedly deliberated on the inexplicable occurrence. More of this later. Police took up station in and all around the house. In the evening, 27 stones and a large iron shackle fell in the house in an hour and a quarter, although all windows and doors were closed. Nightfall only put an end to the bombardment. On the following morning, a large iron nut that had laid in the court for months past fell from the kitchen ceiling, so far as could be ascertained, and dashed a dish from the Indian cook's hands. In the bathroom, I was struck by a large stone which entered by a six-inch space above the door. A detective inspector was at the moment leaning against a tree six foot distant, but he had seen nothing. At midday, stones fell on the roofed back veranda, and I saw a large bullmouth shell that with others had lain on the tiles of the veranda for two years rise of its own accord to a height of five feet and make straight for the little nonin who fled shrieking later when she was laying my study table for tea, a stone flew into the partially open door and I crouched to catch it, but as it entered the room it swung 40 degrees right and smashed glassware and a milk jug on the table where the nonin was standing. This caused me to come to the determination, a weak one maybe, that the nonin must go, but she left for home before I could tell her not to return. No stones fell during the night but the morning of the fourth day saw a resumption of the bombardment. Six police surrounded the court and courtyard, one of them high up a tree. I packed off my wife and babe to her mother's house and stones fell there, though still doing little damage. Then a retreat was made to a neighbor's house, and the stones followed, smashing pot plants and a table on the veranda. I took my people to the hotel and left for the office to bring out my paper, only to be summoned to take wife, babe, and Nanan away. Leaving the hotel, a stone flew into the car but was caught before it could strike anyone. It was the stone with the hole in it that, to the best of my belief, lay in my courtyard a mile away. Arriving at home, I once packed the Nanan off for good and all, and not a stone fell afterwards. But what a mess my home was in, not to mention the fact that it with the street and courtyard contained a thousand excited people, most of them yelling advice, one thousand varieties at me. All I could do was to clear them off the premises, with the exception of the police. I had left my home for the office at 9 a.m., but before going, I'd collected all the stones that had fallen inside the house that morning, fourteen in number, and these I placed on the bed in the adjoining room with a note for the detective inspector whom I'd been momentarily expecting. It was these stones that had wrecked my dining room. I must explain that the two rooms are really one, divided by a wooden partition which cuts in two a window space common to both halves. The wall at this point is 18 inches thick, with the glass of the window flush with the outside of the street wall, leaving a large windowsill recess which was stacked with papers and magazines. A small body can pass from one room to the other round the partition. 
The communicating door between bedroom and dining room was closed and bolted, and the stones traveled horizontally from the bed, round the end of the partition, breaking the window, tearing its curtains, and scattering all the papers on the dining room floor, and smashing the hanging lamp and everything breakable on two tables. Twelve of them remained on the tables amid the wreckage, the others strewed the floor. The house was empty and all doors and windows were locked when this incident occurred. In the year that has elapsed, the occurrence, which was by no means unique in the country, has taken premier place in the three quarterly deliberations of the local psychical society, which has at last announced its inability to suggest a solution for the mystery. A similar reply was received from the parent British Society of Physical Researches. When Weird Darkness returns, the Hamilton Byrne family was anything but typical. Rather, it was a doomsday cult with a leader who believed herself to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. By the time Anne Hamilton Burr rose to power as a cult leader with a small army of followers, she had amassed a fortune and adorned herself in fine clothes and jewelry. She looked more the part of an urban socialite than a pseudo-religious leader, and her position of influence and wealth was a long way from the small farming settlement a few hours outside of Melbourne where she grew up. Born as Evelyn Edwards in 1921, young Anne's mother died in an asylum after being diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic. Because her father had trouble holding down a job and wasn't up to the task of being a single parent, Hamilton Burr spent much of her childhood in and out of orphanages. After giving birth to a single child and losing her husband in a car accident, Hamilton Burr began to immerse herself in yoga. At the time, yoga was still very mysterious to much of the Western world, but Hamilton Burr was drawn to its connections with Eastern religion and would eventually begin teaching yoga to curious middle-class housewives in Melbourne. What followed was anything but a typical budding career as a yoga teacher. By the early 1960s, Eastern religion and mysticism had begun to capture the interest of the West, and Hamilton Burr had built a reputation for herself among those in Melbourne who were fascinated with the new trend. When she met Dr. Raynor Johnson, a soon-to-be-retired physicist, everything changed for Hamilton Burr. Johnson was captivated by her charm. Speaking of her, Johnson wrote in his journal that she was, quote, "...unquestionably the wisest, the serenest, and most gracious and generous soul I have ever met." The two experimented with LSD, and Johnson introduced her to doctors, nurses, and lawyers who were also seeking New Age wisdom and looking to the charming yoga teacher for guidance. Johnson helped recruit people to the cult, and eventually they used his property, Santinican, on the outskirts of Melbourne as their headquarters, 
building a lodge on the grounds for group meetings and discussions. It didn't take long for weekly meetings to follow, with Hamilton Burr delivering her message, a mishmash of Hindu, Buddhism, and Christianity to her followers. Hamilton Burr thought of herself on the same level as deities Jesus Christ, Buddha, and Krishna, and after being brainwashed by her teachings, so did her followers. In addition to gaining members through Johnson, Santinican member Marion Vilmec also contributed a great deal. She managed New Haven Hospital, a psychiatric hospital which treated many of its patients with LSD. Many of the hospital's staff were members of the family, and it was used as a way to recruit potential new members as well. Hamilton Burr had her members under a spell. They gave her everything – their money, homes, and even children. By the early 1970s, the group had started to procure children. Some of the children were the offspring of members of the family, but others were falsely adopted. Because the cult was made of doctors, nurses, and attorneys, getting around any red tape associated with proper legal adoption was much easier. In all, 28 children were part of the family, and all of them were told that Hamilton Byrne was their biological mother. Their identities were changed, and they were given false birth certificates. The children's last names were changed to Hamilton Byrne, and their hair was dyed blonde in an effort to convince them all that they were actually related. Life for children in the cult was anything but a happy and normal childhood. Designated aunties, adult women in the group, would care for the children, grooming to make them look as identical as possible, recalled Sarah Moore, who was born into the cult. If a child stepped out of place, food would be withheld, or even worse, Hamilton Byrne would lay into them with one of her stiletto heels. Dave Whitaker, who grew up in the family cult, said that everything was fine as long as you obeyed. She's not somebody you argue with, said Whitaker. Even if Hamilton Burr was not around to dish out the punishment herself, she still took part in it. When she was away, she would call the aunties and listen to them discipline the children through the phone. If the beatings weren't enough, the children would regularly be given doses of Valium to keep them docile until they turned 14. They also would be given large amounts of LSD and told by Anne Hamilton Burr that she was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Once the children reached adolescence, they underwent a bizarre drug-fueled initiation ceremony. They were given a dose of LSD and left alone in a room for a period of time, only receiving visits from Hamilton Byrne or one of the cult's psychiatrists. Like many cults, the children and other cult members had little contact with the outside world. It was all part of the family's motto – unseen, unknown, unheard. However, that motto would come to an end in 1987. In that year, 14-year-old Sarah Moore was expelled from the group because of her rebellious behavior against Hamilton Byrne. She eventually went to the police and a raid was conducted on the group by law enforcement on August 14th. The children were taken into protective custody, and Hamilton Byrne fled the country before eventually being arrested in 1993 on charges of fraud while hiding out in the Catskills of New York. Surprisingly enough, she served almost no jail time, but was ordered to pay damages to numerous individuals for psychological abuse. Today, Anne Hamilton Byrne sits in a nursing home with severe dementia, unaware of the pain and suffering she caused for so many individuals. For the children who escaped the family cult, the cruel control wielded by Hamilton Byrne isn't something they will ever forget. She just changed your whole world, said Moore. She turned it upside down overnight. Evelyn Hartley was a pretty, well-liked student at Central High School in La Crosse, Wisconsin. 
Her father Richard was a biology professor at La Crosse State College, and her mother Ethel was a homemaker. On the evening of October 24th, Evelyn had agreed to babysit the 20-month-old child of Vigo Rasmussen, a professor and colleague of her father's. When she left home, she was wearing red jeans, a white blouse, white bobby socks and glasses. Evelyn typically checked in with her mother while she was babysitting. When several hours passed with no word from her, Ethel asked her husband to call the Rasmussen home. There was no answer. Worried, he drove over and found the front door locked. He knocked repeatedly, but there was no response. Richard searched until he found an unlocked basement window and entered the house. To his shock, he discovered that the only occupant of the house was the baby, sleeping peacefully in a crib upstairs. Evelyn was nowhere to be found. Richard immediately called the police. When officers arrived, they also searched the house. They found one of Evelyn's shoes and her glasses, which were broken. Her other shoe was found in a different room in the house. They discovered bloodstains both inside and outside the residence. There were also bloody footprints on the pavement outside the garage. Search dogs were brought in to follow the scent, which ended at the street. Detectives surmised that Evelyn had been put into a car and driven away. A massive search began that night. Police officers and volunteers covered the town on foot, while the National Guard, Civil Air Patrol, and the Air Force searched from the sky. Men searched the Mississippi River and walked the banks. College and high school volunteers joined the effort, and within the first few days of her vanishing, there were more than 2,000 people looking for Evelyn. The search expanded outside of town. Hunters were asked to stay alert while out in the field. Farmers were asked to check their land for any sign of Evelyn and, more ominously, for the suggestion that any of their land had been freshly dug for a grave. The idea sent police officers to local cemeteries where fresh graves were unearthed to see if Evelyn might have been buried in secret. Roadblocks were set up around La Crosse so that officers could check the trunks and back seats of every car for fresh blood, or anything out of the ordinary. There were more than 40,000 stickers printed for the search, each reading, My Car Is Okay. Officers placed a sticker on every car that had been checked and cleared. The police even deputized gas station attendants to report any suspicious vehicles and to provide the license numbers of any drivers that refused a mandatory search. Richard and Ethel made numerous public pleas for information. They even addressed their daughter's abductor and begged for her release. Soon after, the Hartleys received two telephone calls in which a man offered to trade information about Evelyn for $500. The police set a trap for the caller and captured Jack Dufferin, 20 years old. But he knew nothing about Evelyn's whereabouts. He was charged and convicted for attempted extortion. Friends, neighbors, local businesses, and civic organizations collected money for a reward fund for any tips that might lead to Evelyn's return. The fund quickly grew to $6,600. Hundreds of tips flooded the police station. Each one was investigated and then promptly dismissed. No one, it seemed, had any idea of what had happened to Evelyn. The case grew cold, but the authorities didn't give up. A year after Evelyn's disappearance, Sheriff Robert Scullin estimated that his department had questioned 1,200 people. Detective Captain Leo Kim, who led the initial investigation, placed that number higher at around 3,500. But despite their efforts, no new leads were discovered. The case was eventually given to A. M. Josephson, an investigator for La Crosse County. He pursued the case for years, focusing primarily on two items of interest that were found early in the investigation, a pair of tennis shoes found on Highway 14 and a blood-stained denim jacket that was found nearby. He believed that they were important clues if the case was ever going to be solved. 
The shoes had been found about 10 miles southeast of La Crosse, near Shelby, Wisconsin. The tread on the bottom of the shoes had a distinct pattern that detectives believed matched some traces of mud found in the Rasmussen house. Josephson discovered that the soles of the shoes exhibited a distinct wear pattern consisting with operating a Whizzer motorbike. Over the next few months, he pored over sales records and receipts and even tracked down past and present owners of Whizzer bikes, but never found any worthwhile suspects. The jacket and shoes were photographed and put on display throughout the region, with a plea for information from anyone who might recognize them. Once again, calls flooded the police hotlines, but again, no new leads were found. As the case got colder, the shoes and bloody jacket were dismissed by most investigators. The shoes were size 11, but the jacket was only a small size 36. Many detectives felt they were unconnected, but not Josephson. He believed that two kidnappers had taken Evelyn. He continued his search, but his efforts ultimately led nowhere. Years went by without any answers. By 1959, the last remaining efforts fizzled out, and while the Evelyn Hartley case was left open, most believed it would never be solved. In the years that followed, quite a number of individuals came forward and confessed to the crime. In 1971, a 51-year-old transient named Tommy Thompson was arrested in Casper, Wyoming for passing bad checks. While locked up, he told police of a rape and murder that he had committed in 1953 and named Evelyn as his victim. Authorities checked Thompson's claims and found that he had been in prison in Minnesota at the time Evelyn disappeared. There were other confessions too, but all of them fell apart after being investigated. In 1957, some investigators tried to link Evelyn's disappearance to the crimes of Ed Gein, a Wisconsin man who had recently confessed to murdering two women and fashioning trophies out of human body parts. It was discovered that he had been visiting relatives in La Crosse around the time of Evelyn's disappearance. However, a search of his property and two lie detector tests ruled him out in the kidnapping. Authorities officially declared that Gein was not connected to the case. Evelyn's parents remained haunted by her disappearance for the rest of their lives. In an interview that they gave in 1978, they admitted to losing all hope of finding out what happened to their daughter. It was the last public statement about the case that they ever made. To this day, the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley remains unsolved. These are an assortment of experiences that I've had while living in my house. These aren't very obviously paranormal, and a keen scientific mind might be able to explain these away, but I'm convinced that I've had a few brushes with the supernatural. This one dates back almost nine years. I was on the computer doing whatever teens do when I heard a door slam loudly somewhere in the opposite end of the house on the lower floor. Figuring it would be my sister, who did have a habit of slamming doors when in one of her moods, I yelled in the general direction, asking what's wrong. On not getting a reply, I went to check on her. I went downstairs to an empty home, and the air was still as a summer noon. No idea what made that door slam so loudly. My house has a terrace just outside my room. I love it and spend countless hours in there, pacing as I gab on the phone, sneak an occasional smoke, or just take in the scenery and contemplate things. I especially love it during the monsoons, as I stand there watching the clouds roll in with their showers. But something about the place gives me the creeps at night. The fact that it faces a thicket of trees doesn't help. Invisible critters create a shrill cacophony at night, and I tend to avoid the place then. This one time I was out on the terrace at night. I didn't want anyone overhearing me talking to my boyfriend. The place was creepy as usual, except something seemed amiss. It dawned on me that not a single insect or bird was making any noise. 
wondering if a snake had wandered into the neighborhood – it has happened before – I futilely attempted to peer down into the velvety darkness. As I neared the wall close to the thicket, I suddenly felt colder and could see my breath condense in front of me. This was extremely unusual given that this was an Indian summer night with temperatures close to 80 degrees. I've read similar stories where someone explained how this happens due to a rapid temperature change or something. Can't recall, maybe it was one of those cases. But nevertheless, I hastily made my way to my room and continued my call. This is my mom's story, who swears it happened. She'd been working on an article – she works as a correspondent for a daily – late into the night when she heard a faint whisper calling her name. Maybe it was a hallucination brought on by overworking herself or something like that, but she swears it sounded like my dad, who had been dead for almost 16 years at that point. The same night, she had a dream where she saw her dead husband cross a veil to somewhere. She almost followed him but woke up before she could do it. She's convinced she would have died had she followed him. She being a superstitious person, had a Hindu priest perform a ceremony of sorts, similar to a Christian priest blessing the house, I guess. Creepy. Moving on. This one is the scariest thing I've ever experienced up to this date. It's likely to remain so. I'd been having a party at my place as my mom had left the house to my sister and I for the weekend. We naturally proceeded to call all of our friends over and get drunk. Around two in the morning, the music had turned down and it was just a group of people talking over cigarettes and cheap scotch. Tragedy struck. We ran out of smokes. Four of us left the place to buy a fresh pack or two. Yes, drunk driving was involved. We bought our smokes and were nearing my place. Now, Before you see the entrance to my house, you make a turn and there's maybe 50 meters of open road. This is important to the story. There's another entrance from the main street as well, which we were not taking at this time. I was in the back seat, babbling, being happily drunk, while one of our soberish friends drove. As we made the turn, he stepped on the brakes and swore loudly, snapping us out of our haze. All of us saw it. A woman, almost seven feet tall, was menacingly making her way down the road in the opposite direction toward the main street. She was draped in the traditional Indian garb, and from what we could see of her skin, it seemed like it was made of porcelain. Her skin had this weird sheen to it. Her arms swung wildly, and she covered the distance in rapid strides and made the other turn which would have led her on the main street. The driver gingerly stepped on the gas and made it to the main street to see deserted streets and footpaths. Save for the occasional car or stray pooch, there was no traffic. We went back home and passed the rest of the night swapping spooky stories. I still cannot forget the terror I felt. Was it an alcohol-induced vision? Maybe, but how could the four of us have the same hallucination? This last experience I'll share with you, and then I'll conclude. My grandfather came to live with us as he neared the end of his life. We didn't want to put him in a hospice and instead wanted him to have all the comforts of our home and be surrounded by his loved ones. We set him up in a spare bedroom, brought in his favorite rocking chair and his hand-rolled cigarettes. He lived with us for almost a year before moving on. The spare bedroom was brought back in use and I let one of my friends from university sleep in there after it was too late for him to go home. He didn't know my granddad had lived in there, but the next day he told me of the salt pepper haired man smoking near the window as he slept. He said he could smell the unfiltered cigarette smoke. Maybe my grandfather's photo on the mantelpiece could have subconsciously given him an idea, but that doesn't explain the smell of cigarettes. I'll have dreams of him, my granddad, if I choose to sleep in that room for any reason. In those dreams, I'm convinced he's still alive. Often I wake up in a cold sweat realizing that it was just a dream and that he'd been gone for the past four years. It's very disconcerting. I have more stories of this house. I still live here when I'm not living in my dorm. Somehow, though, we've gotten used to these and the frequency has decreased over time. 
Still, I don't know what to believe. When Weird Darkness returns, legend tells a centuries-old curse was placed upon Dudley Town in Connecticut. The town turned into a horrible place where people committed suicide or went insane. And October 24, 1926, something went wrong during a performance by Harry Houdini. A week later, he would be dead. Remember staying up late on a Friday or Saturday night, either at home or at a friend's house, and watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-movie with aliens, monsters, ghosts, alien monster ghosts, vampires, werewolves, and all other kinds of crazy, creepy characters? Those were fun nights, weren't they? Well, that's what the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com has to offer – all day, every day. Thanks to our friends at the Monster Channel, you can visit WeirdDarkness.com slash watch party right after listening to this episode and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie – or should I say, horrorable movie. And not only can you watch the B-movies and horror hosts streaming there 24-7, but once a month we all gather together to watch a movie and talk about it in the chat room on that same page. Get your frights and funnies on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. legend tells a centuries-old curse was placed upon Dudley Town in Connecticut. The town turned into a horrible place where people committed suicide or went insane. By the 1800s, Dudley Town was abandoned and it became famous as America's own village of the damned. What did really happen in Dudley Town? Is there a rational explanation to all these unexplained events? Or does Dudley Town suffer from the old curse? Dudley Town was once a thriving community. Today, it's just a ghost town on private property and access is forbidden. The town's legend has long attracted paranormal investigators, journalists, hikers, the occasional birder, curiosity seekers, and just ordinary people inclined toward the supernatural. Some hikers who've been in the area report they have seen mysterious orbs. The story goes back to the 1700s when the Dudley family moved to an area near Cornwall, Connecticut. It's said that the Dudley family brought a curse to this small town, a curse that has allegedly plagued the region ever since. Apparently, during the reign of King Henry VI, Edmund Dudley was beheaded for being a traitor to the crown. All members of the Dudley family were believed to be cursed ever since and when Edmund's descendants moved from the Old World to the New World, they brought the curse with them. According to the curse, all of the Dudley descendants would be surrounded by horror and death. Those who believe in this curse claim that the Dudley family began to experience a rather disturbing run of bad luck. The Dudleys were farmers who made a home for themselves in Dudley Town. They owned the land and allowed people to come and live there, but things didn't turn out well. The land was not good enough for farming, and by the 1800s the settlement was abandoned. Local historians dispute the claim that the Dudley family was cursed, though. To date, they've not been able to link the Dudley Town founders with their Old World descendants, but strange things did happen in the village in Connecticut. Many mysterious events, such as madness, suicide, fatal accidents, natural disasters, vanishings, and unexplained sightings led to the articles in the media. It is said one of the Dudley brothers went insane. On one occasion, at a barn raising, a man fell to his death. Some think he was murdered. Lightning struck and killed a Dudley Town woman right on her porch. She was the wife of General Herman Swift 
who went insane and died soon after. A sheep herder lost his family and home, his wife died of tuberculosis, and his children disappeared. When his house burned down, he wandered into the woods never to return. It has been reported that two women, Mary Cheney and Harriet Clark, went insane in Dudley Town and committed suicide. In fact, Clark allegedly claimed she saw demons before she died. Are all of these strange incidents really the result of a curse on Dudley Town? Reverend Gary P. Dudley, a Texas resident and the author of The Legend of Dudley Town, Solving Legends Through Genealogical and Historical Research, disputes these accounts of the unlucky town. In tracing the genealogy of his name, he found virtually no historical basis for Dudley Town's cursed reputation, no genealogical link to Edmund Dudley, no mysterious illnesses or deaths. Reverend Dudley, who investigated the history of Dudley Town, says that Harriet Clark did commit suicide, but in New York, not in Dudley Town. When old legends mix with rumors, gossips, and uninvestigated sightings, it's really difficult to learn the truth about what really happened in Dudley Town. Many of the deceased people are long gone and have no relatives. This makes investigations even harder, if not impossible. Whether you believe in the power of curses or not, there is something special about Dudley Town. No matter how much historians dismiss the curse, many people just can't get rid of the feeling that there is something strange about such a small area with so many disappearances, unusual deaths, suicides, and cases of insanity. Those who plan to visit Dudley Town should think twice before making the journey. The land is owned by the Dark Forest Entry Association. Trespassing on their property is strictly forbidden. Not to mention, if you do decide to trespass, you might be the next victim of the curse. On October 24, 1926, famed magician and escape artist Harry Houdini gave his final public performance at the Garrick Theater in Detroit, Michigan. Within a week, Houdini would be dead, ushering in an even greater legend than the one he created in life. In early October 1926, Houdini began a week-long engagement in Providence, Rhode Island. At the same time, his wife Bess came down with a terrible illness. Sick and feverish, she stayed in bed and Harry stayed by her side. The doctors diagnosed her with ptomaine poisoning, and it was days before her fever broke. Houdini, with little sleep, continued with meetings and shows. He traveled to New York, dozing fitfully on the train, and then on to Albany for a scheduled show on October 11th. During the performance, a chain slipped during Houdini's famous Chinese water torture cell escape, and he fractured his ankle. A doctor in the audience advised him to end the show and go to the hospital, but he refused. In fact, he finished the entire performance, painfully hopping on one foot. Afterwards, he stopped at Memorial Hospital in Albany for treatment and x-rays. He was ordered to stay off his feet for at least one week, but he continued his shows against their advice. It would take more than a broken bone to stop a Houdini tour. Harry fashioned a leg support for himself and went on to Schenectady and then Montreal. On October 18th, he opened at the Princess Theater, and a doctor examined his ankle. He told Houdini the same thing that the earlier doctor had – stay off it for a week and the bone would knit. Houdini, however, continued to lecture and perform, although he did remain seated during his lectures. After one lecture at McGill University, students and faculty members surged forward to meet him. One young man showed Houdini a sketch he had made while Harry had been talking. The magician pronounced it as an excellent likeness. He autographed the picture and invited the artist to make a close-up portrait later in the week backstage at the theater. On the afternoon of Friday, October 22nd, the McGill University artist Samuel J. Smiley and Jack Price a fellow student and friend, 
met Houdini in the theater lobby around 11 a.m. He escorted the students to his dressing room. Harry hung up his hat and overcoat, took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves, and removed his tie. He opened his shirt collar and leaned back on the couch to look through a pile of letters on his dressing room table. He was talking about his career as Smiley began to sketch the portrait. He was hard at work on the drawing when a third student, J. Gordon Whitehead, came in and began talking to the magician. Houdini was very courteous to the young man but was also occupied with his mail. He wasn't paying close attention when Whitehead asked if it was true that Houdini could withstand powerful blows to the stomach. He absently replied that he could as long as he had time to brace himself in anticipation of the punch. The boy, thinking that Houdini had given him permission for just such a demonstration, suddenly leaned forward and struck him four times in the abdomen with a clenched fist. When Houdini looked startled, the boy quickly backed away, explaining in a panic that he'd thought Houdini had given him permission to hit him. Smiley and Price thought Whitehead had gone mad and grabbed for the boy to pull him away. Houdini stopped them with a pained wave. Whitehead felt terrible seeing the performer so clearly in pain, but the magician soon recovered enough to reassure the young man that he was fine and then step onto the stage for his show. Throughout the evening, Houdini was seen wincing in pain, and late that night he admitted to crippling pains that continued to get worse. He was unable to sleep when he returned to his hotel room, and Bess, believing that he had a stomach cramp or a strained muscle, massaged him in an effort to make him more comfortable. His performances over the next two days consisted of hours of agony, save for brief intermissions when he fell into a restless sleep. After his final Saturday show, he told his wife about what had happened in the dressing room. By then, it was too late to get a doctor. An assistant wired the show's advance man in Detroit and told him to have a physician ready who could see Houdini when they arrived. The train arrived late, and Houdini went straight to the Garrick Theater rather than to the Statler Hotel where Dr. Leo Dretzka was waiting in the lobby. When the doctor finally got to the theater, he found Houdini busy helping his assistants with props for the evening show. There was no cot in the dressing room where Dr. Dretzka could examine the magician, so Houdini stretched out on the floor. He was diagnosed as having acute appendicitis. He had a fever of 102 degrees, but refused to go to the hospital for the emergency surgery that he needed. He was scheduled to perform at a sold-out show that night and was determined to be there. The theater manager had already told him that the house was full. Houdini replied, they're here to see me, I won't disappoint them. By the time he took the stage, his fever had gone up to 104. He was tired, feverish, and tormented by abdominal pains. Plus, he was hobbling on the broken ankle from two weeks earlier. He somehow managed to perform the entire show, although his terrified assistants were constantly forced to complete some of the motions that Houdini couldn't manage. Spectators reported that he often missed his cues and that he seemed to hurry the show along. Between the first and second acts, he was taken to his dressing room and ice packs were placed on him to try and cool his fever. This was repeated between Acts 2 and 3 as well. Toward the end of the evening, he began doing what he called little magic, with silks and coins, card slights and accepting questions and challenges from the audience. He remained on the stage throughout the evening, but just before the third act, he turned to his chief assistant and murmured, drop the curtain, Collins, I can't go any further. When the curtain closed, he literally collapsed where he'd been standing. Houdini was helped back to his dressing room where he changed his clothes but still refused to go back to the hospital. He went to his hotel, still convinced that his pain and illness would subside. It was not until the early morning hours when Bess threw a tantrum that the hotel physician was summoned. He in turn contacted a surgeon, and Houdini was rushed to the hospital against his will. An operation was performed immediately, but the surgeons agreed that there was little hope for him to pull through. His appendix had ruptured, and despite the efforts of medical experts, it was suggested that best contact family members. The great magician, the doctors pronounced, was near death. He passed away October 31, 
Halloween Day, 1926. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors for most of the stories in the show notes. The History and Hauntings of the Hindenburg Disaster is from the book And Hell Followed With It by Troy Taylor. Old Man of the Cave was posted at YourGhostStories.com. Evil Spirits and Demons of Marshes and Swamps in Slavic Folklore was written by A. Sutherland for Ancient Pages. Bumps in the Night was posted at GhostsAndGhouls.com. Black-Eyed People – Why Are They So Different from the Rest of Us was written by Ellen Lloyd for Message to Eagle. The fictional story Seer of Possibilities was written by Thomas O. and posted at Creepypasta.com. Alternative 3 was posted at The Unredacted. Black Angel of Death is by Oren Gray for the lineup. The Interdimensional Interlopers of 1965 is by Brent Swatzer for Mysterious Universe. Siren of the French Broad is posted at North Carolina Ghosts. The Joker was written by Rory Cavanaugh and submitted directly to Weird Darkness. Cappy Ricks and the Stones was written by Cropster at The Fortian. The Babysitter Who Vanished was written by Troy Taylor for Haunted America, Inc. An assortment of experiences was posted at YourGhostStories.com. Inside the Family Cult is by Joel Stice for all that's interesting. Cursed Dudley Town was written by Ellen Lloyd for Ancient Pages. And Houdini's Final Performance was written by Troy Taylor for Haunted America, Inc. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions, and now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 31, verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. And a final thought, time devoted to planning for tomorrow is time well spent. Time devoted to worrying about tomorrow is time wasted. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.